All right, that concludes our public comment. I wanna thank everybody that has contributed. I appreciate it, thank you very much. Um, obviously, this is a issue we're gonna be dealing with a little bit tonight and possibly with some other, um, other procedures or policies in the future. Um, next, we have changes to the agenda. There's already been two recommended changes um, and this relates to the um, discussion item KLB. There's actually a KLB-E and a KLB-F. So if the school board doesn't mind, we're gonna add that. That was a recommendation from Dr. Boyd and um, Dr. Wright. So we wanna be sure that that's included. It is part of the KLB policy, but these, these will include the forms. All right, next on the agenda is the presentation of the FY24-25 budget presentation. Dr. Boyd. I'll go down to the diocese if that's all right. Okay, good evening everyone, good evening board members. John, you can go ahead and uh, place the presentation on the screen if you, if you could please. All right, there was a lot of great public comment tonight and I think this is the first time that this budget presentation is, is not taking center stage, so I'm good with that. <laughs> uh, this evening tonight we will begin having our conversation, our annual conversation about our projected revenue and funding request for fiscal year 2025. As we begin this presentation, I would just like to um, remind the board that you do have before you your budget book this evening. So your budget book is the book that we reference every year. And I just wanna walk you through, I know we have two new board members and I know our, our, our three experienced board members have some experience with the board book, with the um, budget book, but just really quickly, if you open your budget book and take a look at your tabs, the first red tab in your budget book and this will be good as you're fielding questions in the community and you're talking to our Board of Supervisors members about uh, every single dollar that's um, available in the school budget. So if you're trying to work through any questions or any uh, line items, this is gonna be your reference. So if you take a look, the red tab is gonna show you a copy of the presentation that I'll present this evening. The presentation is just really an overview. It talks about some of the budget highlights. As you work your way through the budget book, you'll see it goes into much greater depth on every single line item in the budget as it pertains to personnel and as it pertains to uh, things that are in our school budget. Turning past the presentation, you'll see a uh, tab titled revenues. This is the tab that comes from the state. This talks about where all of the funding for public education comes. As we all know, public education is a very complicated and challenging uh, um, Rubik's Cube really on how we receive funding. We receive obviously local funding, which is this budget request. We receive a lot of money from our uh, state uh, government and also a good portion of funding from our federal, federally uh, mandated programs. So you can see that in that re revenue document. Turn the page. The next tab, the blue tab, <clears throat> is your budget book. Excuse me. <clears throat> this budget book is gonna show you line item by line item. It's 69 pages long and it includes the initiatives that I'll go over in this budget presentation this evening. So if you're looking for uh, specific information about teacher salaries or equipment or healthcare costs or anything, you'll find that in this section of the budget. If you turn past that 69 page document, you'll then see a brightly colored uh, Excel spreadsheet. Those board members that have seen this before, we, re we refer to this section as the budget builder. This section is all of the, I like to refer to it as the stuff of the budget. So you, it, it's broken down by departments. The first couple pages of that is a summary of those departments. So make sure you understand that. This is oftentimes confused to be repeat information, but the first couple pages of that budget builder is the summary of the expenses for, for the things that are in the budget for each of those departments. And you'll have a lot of questions in that section from our community. All right, those are all of the uh, pieces of the budget book. Like I said, you'll become very familiar with that. All right, so as we venture into this budget this year, um, 
I'd like to just give you a general theme or a general idea of, of where we're coming from when we created this budget this year. My responsibility as a school board, as, as the superintendent of the uh, King George County School Division is to present a needs-based budget. So part of this budget is to present the needs of the school division, but it's very important to consider that with a backdrop, a backdrop of our community and where we stand as um, citizens of King George County. So we've had a lot of conversations. We've built on a very strong, strong relationship with our board of supervisors. And I think as we move forward and we work through this budget presentation, you'll start to see that this budget presentation this year is one in consideration of the strong relationship we've built with our board of supervisors. It's one in, in consideration of the financial uh, position of the county right now. And it's one that still, given those uh, parameters, attempts to address some of the goals that we have in our strategic plan. So hopefully we meet, we've met those goals as we work through this. The slide you're seeing now, if you, if um, I'm not sure board members, if you want to review, if you want to take a look at the pack of uh, the um, presentation in your binder, or if it's easier to look behind you, what you see now is our budget development timeline. Our budget development timeline is from beginning to end. This process started way back in November. It's hard to believe that we are about two thirds of the way through, but we still have a lot to do. And uh, funding in public schools in Virginia is a process that really lasts uh, the last couple of years all the way up through June. So um, we're now into the second week of February. Tonight we're presenting this to the school board. Tomorrow uh, we'll really start um, speaking with our Board of Supervisors members and making sure they have the information they need to make informed decisions about the school budget. Next slide, John. All right, inputs and process when it comes to the school budget. So developing a, a school budget, there's a lot of input. There's a lot that goes into it. So if you take a look at that graphic, superintendent, there's the middle. My responsibility as superintendent is to prepare a budget with an estimate of the amount of money deemed to be needed to support the school division. And in order to do that, we reference our strategic plan. We've talked a lot uh, at school board meetings. We talk a lot in our school division. And in fact, all of our goals, a lot of what we do as a school division is wrapped around that strategic plan. We use that to inform our budget objectives. We've had a number of community forums this year. This is an opportunity for our folks in the community to solicit feedback as it pertains to our budget. Uh, we use our budget builder. That's what I talked about earlier when it, uh, in, in your budget binder, board members. That is really our supervisors and our principals opportunity to provide feedback to the budget. We solicit staff feedback every year through a staff survey. This year we did something a little different. I, I took a day and visited every one of our schools and sat um, in, in, in an assigned spot at each school and just had listening sessions with anyone that wanted to speak with me about uh, budget initiatives moving into this budget cycle. Obviously a lot of what we do when it comes to school uh, budget funding is uh, listening to the General Assembly, making sure we, we understand what's going on. You'll find out real soon that this budget process is very fluid. What we're operating on tonight is the governor's proposed budget. February 18th, we have the Senate budget and also the delegate budget that's coming out. All of, all of the numbers, all of the conversation, if you remember last year, will begin to develop as we work our way through those different budgets. And obviously we have uh, conversations with our uh, local representatives. So all of that information is used to deliver this budget presentation to you this evening, and then ultimately to deliver this presentation to the Board of Supervisors for approval. Next slide, John. A main factor when it comes to school, but to uh, determining how much a public school division in Virginia receives is our average daily membership. So again, it's, a, it's partially a student funded model. I think you guys have heard at this point, there was a recently a JLARC study I won't go deep into this, but public school funding in Virginia right now is, is archaic and outdated and one that's being updated probably as I speak this evening. As it stands right now, average daily membership is a very important factor as it pertains to public school funding moving forward. Next year, based on the numbers that we are looking at from previous years, and you can see that in the bar graph, 
we're estimating that we'll have 4,390 students in King George County Schools. This is always a good opportunity if you look at that gray table over on the right hand side to take a look at our student enrollment across the school division and also on the far right hand column as it relates to the capacity of those school buildings. Uh, it's always uh, a good idea this time of year to reference our enrollment versus the capacity of those buildings because many of the conversations we've had recently pertain to uh, new school buildings and whether or not we have the ability or the space to, uh, to educate the students in King George County. Next slide. Okay, local composite index. Again, this is a funding model that has been used in the, uh, the Commonwealth for many, 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 many years. The local composite index is basically a measure that the state of Virginia uses to fairly provide funding to all 132 school divisions across the Commonwealth. The local composite index takes a look at th three factors. It takes a look at the true value of real estate in the county. It takes a look at the adjusted gross income in the county, and then also taxable retail sales through businesses in the county. It measures all 132 school divisions in the Commonwealth, and it gives us a factor. And it changes every two years. So this year we have a new biennium, uh, in the 2024-2026, our biennium, our excuse me, our local composite index is 0.36, which basically means that the school, the local uh, government, at minimum, is responsible for 36% of the operating budget for the school division, and the state makes up the difference. Next slide, please. All right, our budget alignment is one uh, that we use, uh, or excuse me, our budget alignment um, is one that references our strategic plan. I won't go through all of our plan, all of our strategic goals. This is something that if you've come to school board meetings before, you certainly are, should be well aware of. In 2002, coming out of COVID, we had um, a number of committee meetings, a number of stakeholder groups get together and um, from parents, educators, uh, local businessmen, local uh, faith leaders, we all came up with the understanding that we had four goals in King George County Schools. The first goal is to uh, invest in our employees. The second goal is to have quality instruction and innovation in our school buildings. The third goal is to have community collaboration, engagement, and communication. And the fourth goal is to have safe, secure, and healthy learning environments. Our budget presentation this evening will reference all four of those goals. In order for us to move forward as a school division, uh, this budget presentation will make sure that we try to address some of the uh, objectives we have in each one of those goals. Next slide, John. Okay, another part of input uh, that we use going into this budget presentation. Every year we ask our staff if they have the equipment, supplies, and programs that they need to fulfill their job responsibilities. This data that we received this year almost looks exactly the same as it did last year. Of our staff members, about nine out of 10 of our educators believe they have all of the equipment, all of the supplies, programs and services they need to perform their job duties. That's, that's uh, we're, we're proud of that information. We think that's good information. Of the uh, you know one out of 10 that disagree with that statement, we begin to ask for some qualitative feedback and see what they can tell us about the things that they believe they need to uh, do their job. If you take a look below, what we also do is we take all of the comments we receive from staff and we organize those into the four goals that we have from our strategic plan. So for, for example, goal one again was employee investment and development. 47% of the comments that came from staff had to do with improving employee investment and development. The number that's in gray is the number that, that we received for that goal last year. So it gives you an idea of how that goal has changed year over year. I think a couple highlights here are, if you take a look at that fourth goal, uh, safe, secure, and healthy learning environments, last year that was at 19%. There's a lot of conversation right now, not only locally, but statewide and, and um, throughout our nation. And we've, we've even heard some this evening 
about how safe, secure, and healthy learning environments is extremely important for our students. So you see how that number has climbed from the 19% last year to 27% this year. Next slide, please. <clears throat> All right, budget initiatives. This is, this is where the rubber meets the road. So what we're gonna do is take a look at our budget initiatives this year. Again, we chose these budget initiatives moving forward because they reference our four goals in our strategic plan, but they're also goals in consideration of where we stand as a county and where we stand as a, as a school division within our county. So next slide. Goal one, strategic plan goal one, you remember this is employee investment and development. So number one there, uh, increase salaries by 1% per Governor Yunkin's recommendation. So again, right now, we're only operating on the governor's proposed budget. And just the next few days, February 18th, we will receive a presentation from, or a budget, excuse me, from the delegates and also from the Senate, which will also suggest a certain salary increase. Right now, the governor of Virginia is suggesting that all school divisions consider a 1% salary increase. That 1% salary increase costs the school division $1 million or $1,332. That's currently in the operating budget request. The second goal that's in our operating budget request is standardizing and moder modernizing curricular and extracurricular stipends. If you've ever been, uh, if you've ever been a coach in King George County, if you have ever um, probably even had stu uh, uh, student athletes in King George County, our stipends have been the same for about two decades. What a stipend is, is the amount of money that a coach receives for doing the, the job of coaching. We all know that we're never going to be able to pay coaches the amount of money and time or, that they put into that job. Uh, what we hope to do this year is increase those because they haven't been increased over the last, like I said, two decades. So we did two things in this objective. We tried to standardize our curricular stipends meaning that we came up with a more logical and consistent uh, pattern from school to school. And we also increased those stipends and the cost to the school division for that change is $127,196. That's currently in the operating budget. The next three that are not highlighted are not in the operating budget this year. Yet, as I said, we're still gonna get the delegate and the uh, Senate budgets, which could change the whole funding model but so you know, the, these are the priorities that we have in our strategic plan goal number one. The next item there is to incrementally adjust our pay scale compression starting at step 10. So I think at this point, I think it was seven or eight years ago, we had an economic downturn. As a result, most school divisions in the Commonwealth had a compression that was created in their pay scale. So for example, year over year, uh, as you continue on the pay scale, usually it's about, you know, a, a percent or two percent increase. Our steps right now, roughly speaking, on average, steps six through ten have a very tight compression in them. They don't increase uh, very much at all. We're hoping, as most school divisions are hoping, in fact, I think this is one of Stafford's main objectives in their budget uh, request this year, is to begin to alleviate some of that compression. Right now, just adjusting that step 10 and that compression, which would obviously increase everyone's uh, salary after step 10, would be $1.3 million. The next objective, and again, not in the, not in the request at this time, understanding where our county is, uh, is to re reward professional growth by awarding educational supplements beyond the bachelor's degree. So right now in King George County, if you have a bachelor's degree plus 15 credits, you receive a flat $750. If you have a master's degree, you receive 7% of your salary. If you have a doctoral degree, right now our policy is you receive $2,000 flat. What we'd like to do is adjust those so that they're all percentages, like our master's degree. Bachelor's plus 15 would be uh, a certain percentage. Master's would stay at seven, and then the doctorate would be a percentage as well. And that's available in your packet. If we made that adjustment with our current staff right now, that would be a cost of 41,000 to the school division. 
The final objective that we had, and again, you'll see as we work our way through this budget presentation, we tried to do a lot of reflection. We tried to, you know, we're fully aware that money doesn't grow on trees. We're fully aware that we have to look inward when we're talking about making some of these changes. And this is an important one as it relates to that statement. Right now, we have a policy that pays our employees that do not use our health care plan $20 a month. And speaking with our employees, many of them, I don't want to speak in general, but many of them don't know that that exists. And furthermore, many of them are almost insulted by it. <laughs> $20 if you don't choose our health care. What that means is that all of the employees that do not choose our health care receive an additional $240 a month, or excuse me, an additional $240 a year. If they worked with us for 30 years, that would be only a different, that would be $7,200 over all of that time. What we'd like to do is reallocate those funds. Right now, across our entire school division, if we took all the money that we are using for the $20 a month for the employees that don't use our health care, that's $63,840. What we'd like to do is change our policy and enhance our sick leave payout program from 5,000 to 10,000. So our sick leave payout program right now, once you leave King George County, after you have five years of continuous service, you can take your accumulated sick leave and you are paid out at 25% 25, 25 of your per, per diem rate. So basically, whatever you make per day, 25% of that can add up to a maximum of $5,000. What we're seeing right now is that after an employee reaches that threshold of receiving that $5,000 payout, that additional amount of sick leave that they have is, is worthless to them. As an employee, it no longer, and the only worth that there is to it is to take off, not come to school, which is not beneficial for our school division. It's not beneficial for our children. So what we want to do is change our sick leave payout from 5,000 to 10,000, use the existing funds that we have for the $20 a month employee health insurance opt-out and really increase the value for our employees. What that means on average is a teacher that works in our school division and again is invested for five years would have to have roughly, now on average, their salaries are different depending on how long they've stayed with us, but on average, they would have to have 100 sick days that they would turn in at the end to receive that sick leave payout. That again is, is an incentive that is valuable to our employees. I would say, I would argue much more valuable than our, than our current employee health insurance opt-out payments. And one that ultimately benefits the children of our county because our, stu our teachers then don't find that, that their leave is no longer valuable and want to hold on to it upon retirement, okay? That was a long explanation for that, so I'll stop there. And that's strategic plan goal number one. I can pause for any questions that you might have right there, or I can just keep going. It's up to you, Mr. Chair. Any questions you want to stop here, or you want them to keep going? Oh, go ahead. Okay. The 100 hours you're saying for the sick leave, is that hours or days? Days. Is that, did teachers gain that much normally? Yes. Wow. So, well, over the like, over the without using them over the course of their career. Oh, okay. Yes, they'll gain more than a hundred days over the year. I know. I know many uh, industries do hours in education. We do days, and usually we get is it ten days, thirteen days. Over thirty years. Okay. Thank you. Other questions, Mr. Rolls? So as far as the pay scale compression, is that something that we'll, I guess, get more detail on at a later date is the plan? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and most certainly as, as the budget changes, 
then it'll be something we can weigh heavier into. And I can certainly, if you have specific questions about where that compression exists or uh, how that cost is, is derived, I, I can address those questions too. Others? I really think this um, sick leave payout program, I think could be very valuable, not only for the teachers being able to uh, receive some money, but then also the, uh, the incentive to, for them to want to be in, in class. And it will also then, I think, help the students. I think it has significance uh, on both sides, for the students, for the teacher, and for the whole division. So thank you for working that out, Dr. Boyd. Yes, sir. And I concur that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next slide, John. Yeah, let's go on. Strategic plan goal number two. Again, this is quality instruction and innovation. This looks like the formatting is not what it was, but I'll go ahead with it. So again, you're gonna to start to see here, especially in this slide, that there's some great programs that the state of Virginia is asking us to participate in, and ones that quite frankly have costs associated with them. So again, uh, what you'll see is increased cost in our school division based on mandated programs that have come out of the General Assembly. And I'll talk to you a little bit about what some of those are. So the first one, uh, we in King George, as, as well as many of our surrounding school divisions, want to provide access. Uh, you've heard a lot about it if you've been listening to uh, many of our board meetings, provide access for King George County students to the Academy of Technology and Innovation at the University of Mary Washington. So again, this was a Governor Yonkin initiative. This is uh, traditionally referred to as a lab school. Uh, across the Commonwealth right now, there are many lab schools starting up. We are fortunate enough to be part of the Academy of Technology and Innovation at UMW. In order to participate in that program, obviously there's a tuition cost. So the tuition is uh, this year $8,500 per student, which again is um, right around the cost or, or a little less than the cost uh, of educating a student in the Commonwealth. And we have uh, elected to reserve seven seats. Seven seats at $8,500 at $8, is gonna cost the school division $59,500. Again, great program, one that we want our students involved in. We see great benefit in that program, uh, but the cost is $59,500 to our, to our school division and to, to our uh, local budget. The second one is uh, our objective and one that quite frankly, we don't have um, much say in denying, although we wouldn't wanna deny it from an instructional uh, standpoint, is to align our math and reading curriculum to the new standards of learning and the Virginia Literacy Act. I'll speak about the Virginia Literacy Act quickly. So in, in um, 2022, the Virginia Literacy Act was passed by the General Assembly. Uh, it's, a, it's a great program. It talks a lot about the science of reading and making sure that our kindergarten through second grade students have mastered the concepts of reading before they go on to the, to the upper grade levels. As we all know, uh, it's extremely important to learn how to read because following second grade, we read to learn. And um, taking a deep dive into the processes and practices associated with the, the uh, learning of reading is something that came out of that Virginia Literacy Act. That Virginia Literacy Act does cost our school division. The total estimated cost for our school division is 182,000. And what that has to do with is the required and approved textbooks that we have to purchase. Uh, the state has mandated that every school division in order to uh, adhere to the principles of the Virginia Literacy Act, have approved uh, uh, textbooks, approved software. So again, if you look at that cost breakdown, again, the, the formatting's a little off on the, on the presentation above, but the textbooks that we have to purchase through this, uh, because of the Virginia Literacy Act is $104,000. The software is $53,000. Uh, and then required SOL software for an update of our math curriculum is $24,000. If you move down to the next uh, objective, this again is a result, it's a good result, uh, but it's a costly result of the Virginia Literacy Act. Our reading specialists right now in our schools uh, currently push into classrooms and provide uh, reading instruction to our younger students. With the Virginia Literacy Act, they are changing the role of the, of the reading specialist from 
hands-on with students to more of a coaching role with our educators so that we can coach our teachers how to um, teach reading more effectively. Because that has happened through the Virginia Literacy Act, we have to transition our current reading uh, specialists to coaching roles, and we need to replace those with reading interventionists. So that, that cost, $148,000, is the cost of three new reading interventionists, for one for each of our elementary schools. And then finally, uh, this is not a new cost. This is a cost that has been many over many years kind of baked into our, our um, ins instructional budget. But as you work your way through our uh, budget builder, you'll see that we have a, a pretty strong and high development for professional development in King George County, whether it's tuition reimbursement, whether it's uh, professional development, our current estimated cost right now, which is, is not a new budget request, but it is in our budget, is $88,000. And it's, so if you consider, you know, we, we uh, are the largest department in the county, obviously. Uh, we have over 700 full-time employees. Uh, compared to roughly about 250 full-time employees in the remainder of the county. If you break down that cost of 88,000, you know, it's about $100 per employee, $100, $200 per employee of professional development that we would like to afford them per year if you break it down uh, by staff member. Next slide, please. Or I can stop there if there's any questions about instructional objectives. Board members, do you have any questions? I have one in uh, number three, the transition to current the reading intervention. As you said, that's for three positions, 148,281. Is that their salary or is that? That's their salary and benefits. So for, for all three I understand that, but so it's less than 50,000 for each one of those. Yes, sir. The, these individuals are uh, close to the para scale. Okay, that's what I was wondering. All right, so they're they're close to the para scale, but they're certified teachers in that area. They're not certified teachers. The, these would be interventionists. There is training to to become okay. a reading interventionist, but uh, it's not the same so as a certified like a teacher. It's kind of like a para between a para and a teacher. Is that it's it? roughly in, probably in between there. All right, that's I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Yes, sir. Next slide, John. Okay, again, we have our strategic plan goal number three. This is community collaboration and engagement. Uh, we've had a lot of conversations. I'm happy to, to announce. I know many people would appreciate a lot of these. All of these objectives right now are, are of no cost to the school division. We intend to create a superintendent uh, student advisory committee. Again, we can do that at no cost. Parent advisory committee moving forward at no cost. And again, Mrs. Higgins uh, is, is working with... Um, the school board office to develop consistent school-based communication standards. So again, as we begin to develop and attack the objectives and that goal, we're being very conscious of the of the costs associated with any objective that we have moving forward. And fortunately, this is one that is of, of, of zero cost to the school division. Next slide, John. I think you missed one. All right, our final goal, strategic plan uh, uh, goal four, this is safe, secure, and healthy learning environments. So the first one here has to do with our efficiency. We've had a lot of conversations with our Board of Supervisors members. We've had a lot of conversations with our past Board of Supervisors members. I won't go into the historical, um, you, know, you know, what's happened here over the last 20 years, but in just roughly speaking, in 2004-ish, around that time frame, a lot of the financial uh, activities for the school division were transferred over to the county offices. Uh, we did make some progress in moving back one of those three positions recently. We do now have payroll in the, in the school board office. Uh, what we are hopefully working towards is transitioning all of those services uh, back to the school division. It would certainly make us much more efficient and our ability uh, to, to manage and tackle those tasks. So those other two tasks are accounts payable. Again, as I understand it, there's an individual that works in the county office that works with uh, accounts payable for most, if not all, of the school division. Uh, and then obviously a procurement position. Those three positions, to my understanding, were the ones that uh, left the school division some two decades ago, and uh, we're hoping to work those back. 
and again, in working with this new board of supervisors, we hope that that can be something that uh, is a zero cost sum. If you look at the next objective here, and this is currently in our operating budget request, our effort in creating safe, secure, and healthy learning environments is, uh, is implementing a secondary alternative education program. So there's been a lot of talk in our community about making sure that our schools are safe, making sure that uh, we have appropriate discipline measures in place uh, for our students, and making sure that we have a, a, an educational environment that is not disruptive uh, to students' abilities to, to learn. And I can tell you as a former high school principal, you're, you're usually trying to measure a couple factors here, really two main factors. When you're talking about a student that is not being successful because of discipline in the regular setting. The traditional approach and one that most educators across the country now would tell you is unsuccessful is suspension from school. It's not an effective practice and it's quite frankly one that hurts us as a school division. It hurts the student. Uh, it really affects our chronic absenteeism numbers. And it's one that we really are trying to move away from moving forward. We think that the creation of an alternative education program would allow us to make sure that uh, we have appropriate discipline practices in place in the school building. It's one that we would make sure limits any disruptions in the school building. And it's also one most importantly, when I was talking about weighing those factors when it comes to student discipline, it's one that continues to educate that child. It's one, the, the child that has conducted the discipline infraction. With suspension, we're oftentimes sending students home and it's not the best message, it's not the best approach for, for furthering their education. If we could use an alternative education program here in the county, we could not only ensure that we would work towards less disruption in the school building, but it's also one where we could provide an opportunity for those students to succeed in an alternate education environment. Again, trying to make sure our schools remain safe. We have, excuse me, we were successful last year and hope to be successful again in applying for the school security officer grant. We do currently have a school security officer at King George High School. We are uh, applying for the, gr the grant uh, for an additional position at the high school and also an additional position or, or a new position at the middle school. The way this, this grant works is the state provides the amount of that individual's salary. For us, it would be up to 62%. They, they pay the, uh, if you remember the local composite index, they pay their portion of that salary based on the local composite index and we are responsible for making up that difference. So for those two positions in our county, if we were to receive that grant, it would cost the county $71,000 to again, make sure that we have uh, the pieces in our building uh, for, for, a safe, uh, for a safe environment. And then finally, in this, uh, in this goal, we want to fully implement the two-way communication uh, in and out of the school division uh, following King George County's Communication system upgrade. So let me just explain that. That's a mouthful right there. So uh, in 2002, in December of 2002, the King George County Sheriff's Department, uh, through the capital improvement plan, suggested and received about $11 million, I think, or $10.8 million to upgrade the two-way communication system in the county. This, to my, to my novice understanding, this had to do with uh, improving the repeaters, and improving the frequency, improving the radios, and really the overall communication across uh, the county. This included the Sheriff's Department, this included Fryer and Rescue, and a big part of this presentation was a push for uh, all of this communication to be available to our school bus drivers. Uh, we, re we recently found out that uh, you know, the school division, you know, found out that they underestimated um, at some point the cost of the upgrade to the uh, school buses. And as it currently sits, we are 28 radios and and in, uh, and the installation process short uh, in the school division. So the cost of that, in order to um, fulfill the request that was made through the capital improvement project by the King George County Sheriff's Department, I believe in 2022 
it would cost the school division $146,785. And that's in our current operating uh, request. Any questions about that, board members? Go ahead, Mr. Rawls. I was running about the radio, so is that a variety of different kinds? So you mentioned buses, so some are going buses. Is this also a handheld radios? And the I, I think these remaining 28 are, are bus type radios and they're very powerful radios. These are ones that, um, they have quite a range on them. I think they're, this doesn't mean much to me, but they're 700 megahertz radios that uh, I believe cover cover the county. And and at our, again, I'm not an expert on this, but our, our former communication system really had some, some dead spots across the county, and this is supposed to address those dead spots. <clears throat> Any questions? Yes, yes Mr. Mr. Frank. I, mean, I don't think your mic is on. This one, okay. yeah. this one 149000 for the alternate education program. Is that going to be for teachers? What's that money for? Yes. So that, that is actually the cost of two uh, FTEs or full-time equivalent teachers. So those would be one for the middle school, one for the high school in order to initiate and start this program. We've got a lot of ideas about programming, a lot of things that we think we can do internally. Uh, as far as providing instructional access to those students in that alternative education program, but we need somebody to man the, these, uh, this, this program, and that cost is for uh, one individual at the middle school and one, individu one individual at the high school to, to uh, supervise that program. You know, about 25 years ago, we had one of these. We'd certainly like it back, and we think there'd be great value in it. Okay. Um, yeah, I have a couple of questions. Um, one is that what you were just talking about, this alternative education program, didn't we currently have an MOU or a contract with another division and how much were we spending a year on that average? Yeah, so right now, uh, if you take a look at your operating budget, we have an MOU with the Phoenix program out of SPOTC. Uh, they're actually at the UMW campus. And we have a, a, a certain number of seats available per year for that program. We have, I think, seven seats, that's give or take. And right now we estimate, or excuse me, we budget $30,000 a year uh, to access seven seats. So we could certainly, I think, uh, get more bang for our buck if we had an, uh, a local program. So technically we'd be saving that 30,000 then. I, if we decided not to use the Phoenix program altogether, then we could save that 30,000, correct. Are you suggesting we would continue with the Phoenix program, the MOU? And, I, and do this? Both? I think it's a little early to tell. I think we need to transition into this program and make sure that it's successful. Uh, and, and it's one that serves the needs of our students. Uh, so I think there will be a certain transition period. Uh, but I think ultimately, if we had our own in, in, internal program in the county, it would it, it would serve great benefit across the division. How do we pay that 30000 Is it a per student as it occurs or something at the end of the year? Yes, they, they bill us usually on like a monthly or a bi-monthly basis for the number of seats we're occupying in the program. So it's possible that after six months or so, if we implement this new one and the budget is approved, that we might even be able to drop that if we don't have anybody going there. Potentially. Uh, I know that's potential, but that's always looking for savings. Yes, sir. All right, um, second question, this uh, item three, the $71,274. For the SSO grant, I mean, obviously that's a grant, and you explained some of it, but that will not continue. So, what what's the plan for continuing? Right. That? So, uh, the SSO grant is a four-year continuing grant. So, for four years, uh, they'll cover 62% of the right. total cost. After that, then we would obviously, if we want to continue with the program, uh, and they do not allow renewal after that four years, then there would we would we would be responsible as a local. Uh, school division to pick to pick up that additional 62 percent what's your personal experience that they probably would renew it or continue it uh I, I, my personal experience right now is the state is very interested in making sure that this program is successful good uh, and i can tell you my personal experience right now and having us and i know mr watson is is here and i want to put him on the spot but I, I i've heard nothing but great things about the the program that we've implemented at the high school extra set of hands extra set of eyes uh, really gives us an opportunity to get around the school buildings, get into the bathrooms, get out of the bathrooms, get into the dark corners, get out of the dark right, corners, right. and take care of business. So I think it provides great valuable value, not only to the to um, the students that we're helping to redirect, but really all of the students and all of the staff in the school building. No, I think it's a great idea. Just always concerned about money. When I see grant, and you already said four years, it's probably fine. 
but we will be liable for that in the fifth year. Thank you. Any other questions? One follow up on the alternative education program. So if we got one instructor in the middle school and one in the high school, I know it still just will be standing it up, but any guess as far as how many students who might be able to initially accommodate the first year? Uh, I, I'm, I, I don't know specifically. Uh, again, we, we, we hope we don't have to use it as much as maybe we do have to use it. Uh, for, as a former special education teacher, I, I, in my mind, I know that uh, in order for this to be effective, uh, I, I see it more along lines of like a self-contained environment. So like a 10 to 1 ratio is usually pretty good. Uh, not that, that there's anything that mandates that that has to happen. Um, there's an important function here that I think is of value to discuss is what we hope to gain in this program, and again, this is going into a little more detail, but we think there's great value in introducing some type of character education program into this program. Again, without getting into the weeds, suspension we know now, and not just us, but everybody knows doesn't work because we're removing students from school, but we're not really, we don't have the opportunity right now to instill some of the uh, values that we believe we need to impart on those students in order for them to come back into school and be successful in that environment. So we're hoping that part of this program is not only their ability to stay up to speed with their educational responsibilities, but also infusing some type of character education component so we can start talking about the right ways to do things. Good, thank you. I have a question. Sorry. All right, go ahead. On number four. What are some of the current concerns that you are facing right now that would make this valuable and why we needed to, to do this? Uh, so you, number four is the two-way com, uh, communication. Right. What are some concerns that are happening? Okay. So as it pertains to that, across the county prior to this new initiative that, that came through the capital improvement plan via the sheriff's department, there's a lot of holes in the county when you're on two-way radios. And what I mean by holes is that if you're in, and I don't know where these holes are, but if you're in certain parts of Dahlgren or if you're in the Sealston area, your radios are ineffective, they don't work. So the reason that there's great value in this for our school bus drivers is if there's an emergency, uh, there's great value in their ability to be able to pick that radio up, call the schools, call our first responders, and make sure that they are that they can arrive and, and assist in any way that they need to. You certainly wouldn't want our bus drivers to be, especially if we have the capability. We haven't always had the capability. We do now. You wouldn't want our bus drivers to to not have the full functionality of this new radio system that we have, so that we can ensure safety for our students. All right. Thank you. Go ahead. <clears throat> Next slide, John. All right, so this is just kind of uh, a summary of some of the stuff that we just went over. And again, this is kind of the stuff of the budget request. So this is additional uh, budget builder requests, but this is the same stuff that you really kind of saw uh, in, in some of the last slides. So new new and the, the cost that I highlight uh, as it pertains to what our budget request is gonna look like as I present it to the county. New cost, tuition to the, uh, the uh, lab school, ATI. The cost of the Virginia Literacy Act, 182,000. We always have new uh, and increased costs for special education program. This is not unique to King George County. This is, this is customary across our country right now uh, as it pertains to the, the requirements that we have to educate our special education students every year. There's an increase, honestly, in the number of students that have special education needs and an increase in the needs that those students have. So this year we estimate going into this budget cycle that increase in students and that increase of needs that are uh, recorded through their uh, IEPs, their individualized education plan, we estimate that at $70,000. Uh, we have contracted, as you all know, with Mark III for healthcare consultation. That's a new cost that we hope does pay itself off as we move forward and have an advocate uh, in, in our health care plan, uh, that's, a, that's a new cost of 17000 And just like our home uh, utility bills, the school division, and it's very large size, 
five or six, five schools, a, a preschool and, and the school board office, the increase in the utility costs is $56,000. So again, these costs are going up. You'll, you'll notice that in this budget, as we work our way towards the end, we really tried to be conscious of our, addition, our, of our additional budget requests. And you'll see that as we get to the end here. But when you have cost, <clears throat> like increase in utilities, <clears throat> that, that is going to cost the school division more unless we start talking about you know, reducing other things in the budget. And I hadn't said this already, but a, a school budget is heavily, heavily personnel. 85% of a school operating budget is personnel. A very small 15% is the other stuff that you see here in the budget. So if we're talking about decreasing the school budget, we're talking about having to really tap into that 85%, which I, I think most uh, people are not interested in uh, adjusting, you know, losing staff or losing uh, or, or adjusting salaries downward or anything of that nature. And then finally on this slide, you have that cost, uh, the transportation cost <clears throat> of the right of the radio project, and then again, just like we're experiencing in our home life, an increase in the fuel cost. The total cost there is two hundred and five thousand dollars. Next slide. <clears throat> so uh, again, just kind of in review, uh, these are the additional positions that we're requesting in this year's budget. We talked about the three interventionists. That's a total of one hundred and forty-eight thousand dollars. Uh, we are requesting an additional school counselor because uh, the division ratio is now going to be above the SOQ requirement. So again, not getting in the weeds, the SOQ is the standards of quality. These are the, these are the standards that the state says we have to meet. They have a certain ratio for the number of students that counselors can be responsible for. The division is rising above that SOQ requirement, therefore we need an additional counselor. Uh, we were able to transfer some resources internally so that we can turn our uh, secondary, our middle school and high school ITLs from 10 month to 11 month. This is really gonna help us with our summer responsibilities as it pertains to technology. As you know, we're a one-to-one -one school division now, meaning that uh, there's a ton of work to do on Chromebooks in the summertime and our I ITLs are responsible for those. Working through quickly, uh, our budget request has two FTEs for the high school. One of those FTEs is that alternative teacher I discussed. We're requesting one additional FTE because classroom size at the high school and also at the middle school is, is getting to a point where some classes are rising above 30 students in a classroom to one teacher. So we're asking for one additional FTE in order to lower that student to teacher ratio. You see the school security officer in there, and then you also see um, the FTEs for the for the high for the middle school. Next slide, John. Back one. All right. So the major differences between FY twenty four and FY twenty five, and this is kind of where the rubber meets the road again. That 1% salary increase, again, is $1 million uh, to the school division. If we are fortunate enough, based on the Senate and delegate budget, to address that c compression, that's an additional $1.3 million to the school division. It's highlighted in red there because it's not currently in the operating budget based on the governor's uh, prescribed budget. Health insurance premiums, we haven't even talked about, but as you all know, based on our presentation from the last school board meeting, the renewal rate we're hoping is 20%. We've heard estimates as high as 28, but we're in negotiations with, with that number. And we will find, as I, as I mentioned before, that all this information in the, in the operating budget is very fluid. We typically get the renewal rates from uh, the, the healthcare company within the next month. So that estimated cost is $857,000 to the school division. A total of the budget builder requests is 662,000. That's the stuff we already went through in the last slide. Additional staffing request is $718,000. So again, take a look at all of those additional costs. Yes, thank you, goodness gracious. I thought I was the only one that noticed I couldn't talk anymore. 
It's because I was screaming at the TV until 11 o'clock last night. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so you see those increased costs there to the school division. Uh, now I want to take a look at our the revenues. Next slide, and we're getting to the end here. Next slide, John. Revenues and expenditures. This is really uh, where we start talking about how this all fits into our request as it relates to the Board of Supervisors. So next slide. All right, this is an important slide. Uh, what you'll see here on the left-hand side is our sources of revenue. You have state revenue, federal grants. I won't go through all of those. The next light blue slide is you'll see FY24 budget. So this is the amount of money that we received from those entities. Probably the most important ones you're looking at is the amount of state revenue. And then at the bottom, you see the amount of local revenue requested. So if you take a look at FY24, just to put it in reference for you, last year we received $34 million from the state. We received $24 million from uh, the local government. If you just consider the, the, the governor's budget, <clears throat> all of those costs that, that we discussed so far, we would need uh, only, I don't want to say only, I feel like I'm selling a used car, <laughs> but based on all those requests, all those, all those initiatives, goals one through four, and addressing many of those needs that I mentioned were already in the operating budget, we would be asking from uh, the local government an additional $960,000 based on the governor's budget right now. You do not see any information yet in the House of Delegates budget. You do not see any information in the uh, Senate budget yet, but I do want to bring your attention to really two important points here. Number one, $960,000 is far less than the amount of money that you saw in all of those initiatives. So we've done a pretty good job, I think, of reallocating some resources, adjusting some, uh, adjusting some needs within the school division, and tried as best we could to address many of these challenges looking inwardly instead of just asking the county for more money. Uh, and the other thing I would say, and I know a couple of our board members are brand new at this, uh, this request based on the governor's budget is, is really a fraction compared to some of the requests that have been made in the past. I mean, at this point last year, uh, based on, on all of our budget initiatives, we were somewhere in the ballpark of, of $5 million plus uh, as far as requesting from the from the local government to, to make our budget whole. This year, we're talking about less than a million dollars as the budget stands right now. And that includes stuff like the radio project and things that uh, increase cost in utilities and other things that uh, are really uh, difficult to, uh, expenses to work our way around without cutting services, which again, for a school division, that's personnel because that's 85% of our operating budget. Next slide. Okay, so this again is just the budget increases by appropriation category. The state appropriates our, our, our excuse me, provides us our money based on appropriation category. And uh, as you're having conversations in the community, you can see where the, where that amount of money goes to. The majority of it goes to instruction. This has to do with our teachers. This has to do with the materials and things we need in order to uh, educate our students directly. Uh, and then you'll see those other appropriation categories. If you work your way down to the bottom, again, this is strictly based on the governor's budget, but you'll see the amount of money uh, that we would need from the local government uh, in order to make our budget whole. And the amount in parentheses, or the number in parentheses there is uh, the local composite index based on the total operating budget amount. So for example, <clears throat> Last year, our entire budget uh, was $60, $60 million. The local government was responsible for $24 million of that, meaning they paid for 39% of that budget. So if you remember that conversation about the local composite index, that's how that plays into it. Uh, so again, if you look all the way to the right, you'll see the difference uh, between FY24 budget and the FY25 budget. We've really reduced that local composite index by 1.4% on the front end 
of our ask from the county, which, which I think is, is um, a reasonable and modest ask. Next slide, John. And I think that's it. I'll stop there so that I can conserve my voice and stop for any questions that board members may have. All right, we have questions. Yes. <clears throat> Mr. Rolls. So I'm, you guys don't have a crystal ball, but we've had a real problem with getting paid to make their decisions quickly on funding the past. So is that February 18th date you, may, you mentioned looking pretty good as far as actually having some numbers from them? I think the February 18th date is looking very good. That's that's uh, kind of the crossover point of the General Assembly. In the past, that has not been a date, to my knowledge, that those uh, budgets from the Senate and the, and the House of Delegates are not submitted. Where it get, where, to what you're referring to, after that point, uh, we usually work our way all the way up to June in order for them to uh, agree upon a budget that's delivered from the state. So again, I think by February 18th, we will, my feeling is we'll have a budget from the delegates, we'll have a budget from the ha from the Senate, we already have the governor's budget, <clears throat> and I'll be able to fill in those other columns in that budget presentation. From there, it's it's anyone's guess uh, how, how long it takes this year uh, to pass the budget from, from the uh, state level. <clears throat> Any other questions? Yes, yes, Dr. Boyd, uh, number one, thank you guys for doing this. It's a great presentation. I'm sure you and the staff spent a lot of time on it. Uh, thank you. And I, if I remember correctly, last year when we did this, we had several work sessions, and we're going to have those again this year to talk down to the nitty-gritty about what's in here. Yeah, so I, I'm glad you brought that up. So that's kind of next steps. So tonight we'll have a, a conversation about work sessions, uh, really what we need to do moving forward. Uh, now that we've presented this budget presentation and budget book uh, to the school board, with your permission, what I'd like to do is begin delivering the budget books to our Board of Supervisors members so they can start working through this as well uh, and make sure that we can get as much information out as we can as, as questions start to arrive. Um, next steps are budget work sessions. Next steps are to acquire as much information as we can from the state on next steps in the budget. Yeah, Mr. Frank, that's under discussion. We're going to have that discussion today, tonight. But I think it's, uh, are you looking for a decision or just because I think it'd be great to you to pass this on to the Board of Supervisors because I know they understand it's still a working document. We haven't had a work session yet and there has no public um, presentation yet, but um, they want to be in at the beginning and I think it'd be fine. Okay, that sounds what, wonderful. Wait, I'm only one board member. <laughs> and and again, I, as I understand it, and just so we're on the same page, the, the request this evening is just permission to share this with the board Correct. of supervisors and, and start having conversations and just making ourselves available to them so that we can answer any questions they have as it per pertains to the budget book. I think Mr. as long Chair. as they understand that this is the beginning um, and it's very fluid right now. Absolutely. Other thoughts? What do you feel about that? I, I would be fine with that. Mr. Rolls? With the caveat mentioned, yes. Okay, yeah. Mr. Mr. Frank, Ms. Davis, yes. Okay, good. Yes, go ahead. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. And it also gives us an opportunity to be sharing our book with some of them individually and so on. So I think it's good. Again, as long as they understand, it's a work in progress. Yep. All right, let's go on. Um, there's been a small break requested to use the restroom. It's okay. No, go ahead. Anybody needs to use the restroom, we'll take about a five minute break.
was the meeting. <laughs> so let's continue. All right, next on the agenda is the consent agenda. And if you would, this is just for helpful. You need to go up, back up and go to page 152 on our total packet. And that's where that the minutes begin. The consent agenda begins with, let me get my glasses, sorry. The December 4th, 2023 regular meeting, the consent agenda. And again, it's on, begins on page 152 in that large packet. So I need, um, if, if there are any problems with those minutes, and if there's not, I'll need a motion. So Mr. Chair, you're wanting to do, approve them one by one rather than the entire consent agenda? We could do the entire amount. I just said in the past, there's been cons you know problems. Is there, okay, with either one of the two sets of minutes then, either on December 4th or January 9th, if all of you had a chance to look at them, both of them? I do have some questions for the special meeting. That'd be the December 9th one, right? Right. Well, then let's just talk about the December 4th one first then. Okay. Okay. Any questions about the December 4th minutes, Mr. Frank, Ms. No. Davis? Ms. Hoover? Okay, do I have a motion just only about the December 4th regular meetings? Do I have a motion to accept them? I make a motion to accept the December 4th minutes as presented. Second. All those in favor, second. I have some discussion though. All right. Pardon? Oh yeah, Dis any discussion about December 4th? I just wanna thank uh, Dr. Boyd and your staff. These, these look excellent, I think these are Really well done, a great resource for the community to be able to look through them easily and find what they need. So I know you spent a lot of time talking about it, but it looks really, really good. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it really was great. Shows specific page numbers with every item. That's great. And any other discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Chair votes aye. Motion carries. The minutes are accepted for December the fourth. All right, January the 9th. You'll need to scroll down farther to find the beginning of those, which is, where are we? Anybody find the page number yet? Page number one. <laughs> Page number 60. Page 214. 214. Thank you, Ms. Hoover. All right, Mr. Rolls, you had a question about the, these minutes? Right. So I won't vote on these because I, I was absent, but I did see that it says that Ms. Hoover called it to order even though you are in attendance, Mr. Chair. So is that correct? Yes, well, that is correct. Um, the reason why is there was some question as to whether I was going to be there. And um, at the last minute, um, I was able to, it related to my son, but at the last minute I was able to be there, but Ms. Hoover had already prepared. And so um, for consistency and also for it to run appropriately, I was not prepared mentally <laughs> because my son was dying. And so I said, Ms. Hoover, would you go ahead? Sounds good. Okay, but thank you. That's a legitimate question. Any other questions? Do I have a motion to accept those minutes? I will make a motion that we accept the minutes. Uh, which date? Go ahead and name the date if you don't mind. For January 9. Do I have a second? A second. second. Any further discussion? All those in favor to accept them, say aye. 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 Chair votes aye. Motion carries. The minutes are accepted. All right, next we have an action item, security equipment grant. Dr. Boyd. Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> now, the Virginia Department of Education has awarded King George County Schools a total of $111,676 from the 2023 School Security Equipment Grant Program. These funds are approved for the purchase and installation of school security equipment requested on the applications uh, for the approved schools shown below, which include King George High School, King George Middle School, and Potomac Elementary School. A requirement of the grant is 25% uh, match. That's $27,919. This is an annual grant, grant we received and we do budget for that 25% match. It is the recommendation of the superintendent to approve a motion to accept the $111,676 from the security equipment grant. The school division will, will provide the required 25% local match of funds where required in order to support the installation of additional security equipment at King George High School, King George Middle School, and Potomac Elementary School. 
Mr. Chair. All right, do I have a motion? <clears throat> I move that we accept the $111,676 from the security equipment grant, knowing that the school division will provide the required 25% local match of funds we're required in order to support the installation of the additional security equipment at the King George High School, Middle School, and Potomac Elementary School. I second. All right, further discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Chair votes aye. Motion carries. The grant's accepted. Thank you. All right. Next, we have the, uh, we're going to discussion items. And the first one is policy KLB. And remember, there's some additional KLBE and KLBF on this one. So if everyone would turn to that. And Dr. Wright, you have the floor. Good evening, Chairman Bush, members of the board, Connor, and Dr. Boyd. I uh, come to you this evening with three policy revisions and that the three revisions are related. Uh, I ask that you please hold your questions until the end. Uh, the first of these revisions, which is first in your packet, is KLB, Public Complaints About Learning Resources. The current policy is focused on the complaint procedure outlining very specific guidelines regarding forming committees to review resources and includes exactly who should be on the committee. The revised KLB titled Public Concerns and Complaints About Controversial Issues, Learning Resources, Instructional Materials, and Other Matters is more broad and all-encompassing to focus on any public complaints that may or may not fall under the definition of learning resources. In regards to specific books, whether in the library or elsewhere, or curricular issues, policy KLB specifies that the superintendent is responsible for creating procedures to allow the legal guardians to make the best decisions for their students under the proposed policy. The revised policy KLB is centered on the premise that our school board values input from our community and encourages the parent community to have dialogue with our school leaders regarding their children. In addition, the revised policy KLB provides a path for our citizens who may not have an enrolled child to also share any concerns. One unique difference between the current policy and the revised policy is that the proposed new KLB states that complaints from citizens who do not have children enrolled in the school system, system should direct their concerns to the superintendent's office rather than to a particular school. So I did not read the policy there, but as you can see in KLB, uh, before we move on to the next one, basically uh, the majority of those procedures have been stricken through and then that has been rewritten. Uh, I hit the highlights, but I did not read it. Um, so you can take a glance at that. And maybe before we go on, uh, Dr. Wright is with the dash E and the dash F. Let's deal with any questions. This that, is that's just... fine. That's the majority of it. So let's let's go ahead and do questions for KLB. Okay. Um, so again, this is a discussion item. So ideally, this would go to an action item at the next board meeting. It would give all of us a, a significant, even though we've looked at it now, it would give us time to look at it even more. So let's uh, entertain some discussions about this uh, policy. Yes, Mr. Chair. Yes, Mr. Rolls. I do want to ask about the decision to have residents who don't have students in the uh, schools to just to skip the level of addressing the at, the at the school level and go straight to the superintendent. Yeah, that's a good that, question. Yeah, that would. Yeah. I mean, it surprises me. What, what's the rationale behind wanting to do that? So if I'm a, a citizen, I have a concern. The concern could be uh, very well be at a specific school. It could be with the curriculum in general. Uh, so it really depends on the nature. So rather than going to, and it could be across multiple schools. Uh, it could be, you know, the high school and the middle school. So since there's not a child, a specific child of the citizen that the concern is regarding, we thought it would be best to go to the superintendent's office, then through the superintendent's office, we could direct that concern to the specific school, or it might be something that we want to handle from our office uh, ourselves. If it's an instructional issue, 
then we would probably work with Ms. Hill, the instructional office, and deal with it from that level. If it's more of a school level, at the high school, we would call the principal and we would ask him to work with it. And then maybe the principal would reach out to, to the parent uh, or to the concerned citizen, um, depending on, depends on the, the level of complaint. That yeah, person doesn't make any difference to me. I, uh, and if, if that's what you all think is more efficient, I just wondered if it'd be more of a burden skipping straight to superintendent, but I don't really have a strong feeling. I think we're myself. trying to take a little bit of the burden off of the principal level um, if it's something that we could handle at the, at the central office level, <clears throat> ideally. Okay. My understanding is obviously if there was a concern with a particular school, let's say it was a homeschool student and they use some service at middle school, say, um, they might still go to the superintendent according to this, but then immediately the superintendent would say, when he heard the type of concern, would direct them to the middle school principal. That's correct. So it's not as if it would always just simply be in the superintendents. That's exactly right. Okay. Any other questions? I do have a proposed change. Yeah, sure, go ahead. So if you look at the paragraph starting on page 218 of the packet, which is also the second to last paragraph of the policy, starting with any challenges or, or concerns about books, resources, or instructional materials. I'll just keep reading. It says, in regards to the designation of such materials as containing sexually explicit materials as defined in policy IAA, which of course I meant to say IIA. Yeah, um, that's a mistake. I think it should be IIA is correct. Right, but bigger than that, I, I would like to delete the entire section of that that refers to sexually explicit materials because I think it should be broader. I mean, the challenge can be about anything. It doesn't have to be about sexually mis uh, explicit material. So I would recommend striking the word starting with in regards to the designation of materials as containing sexually explicit material as defined in policy IAA. Just break all those words. And that just makes it more broader in general. I understand what he's saying with this. It makes sense. Let me read it with that part missing. So that... It... Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. One at a time. Okay, let, let Ms. Davis go ahead, Ms. Davis. I mean, this is specifically for sexually explicit materials or is it for any type of concerns? It's it's written so that it could be any concern. So I, I do understand what Mr. Roll is okay. saying. I believe that that is something that would, would work. Okay. The roles, did you want to respond any more to that? No, I mean, that, that's, if you remove that, I think it would be good, so. I, I sense, uh, Dr. Wright, but just a comment, is the beginning of that is any challenges, you know, and what Mr. Rolls is suggesting is to, you know, cut out the concerns about books, and, you know, it could be any challenges and leave out the sexually explicit materials. And I think the reason why you would put that in there is because of the, the situation we're in really right now. Um, and so, you know, is this valid enough that's going on right now to be in there for all times? That's really, I think, what I, Mr. Rolls was kind of referring to. It makes sense. This is more, the, the, the purpose was to be more general, to be more of a catch-all, and so that was probably just an oversight on my part, and I think that's a good uh, revision. We can make that. Okay, obviously, uh, I was not thinking we would vote on this this evening. Obviously, um, that change, I think, could be done. We can look at it again at the next board meeting. I do Mr. have further feedback. Joe, you've had more. Okay, go ahead, Mr. Rolls. Okay, so the last paragraph, second sentence, it says, appeals from the school should be directed to the superintendent, and appeals from the superintendent should be directed to the school board. So I would just change that wording to be more along the lines of appeals of principal decisions should be directed to the superintendent and appeals of superintendent decisions should be directed to the school board. I think that would be a little bit clearer. But not just say it, the style of suggestion, but I have something more substantive to add as well. Well, let's, let's stay with your first concept here. 
I think what you're saying is, is obviously some of this may go straight to the superintendent and then it would be directed from him to the school board. Some of these would be directed to the principals first and therefore the chain of command is that. I'm not changing the meaning, just the wording. They're, they're saying it, it for the parents, they're appealing to the school first and then the superintendent and then the school board. I'm not changing that flow at all, just the wording to make it clearer. Dr. Wright, do you have any comments about that? No, that's that's fine. I got it. All right, any others before Mr. Rolls goes on with further suggestions with that one? I couldn't really hear what he was saying. Okay, Mr. Mr. Rolls, just re maybe repeat exactly what you said and what you, small change. Uh, so it's not changing the meaning at all. Right now, if you read that second, sentence of the last paragraph it says appeals from the school should be directed to the superintendent and appeals from the superintendent should be directed to the school board and i'm just suggesting changing the wording slightly to say appeals of the principal decisions should be directed to the superintendent and appeals of superintendent decisions should be directed to the school board so we play school with principal, really, the wording. That's one of the changes. I got the wording changed. All right, did, that's, you, that's fine. did you hear that, Ms. Davis? All right, Mr. Rolls. And then the final thing is, right, and I noticed this in the original KLB as well, is it seemed to imply that if you're not happy with the decision, it can it, um, it gets appealed to each level every time, which could result in a situation where everything is getting appealed to the school board, at, at what point you're wondering, well, why don't we just appeal the school board to begin with? And it could just become a bit much, you know, if we're, because we have to have our discussions in public. Principal policy is, is one person that can do it, you can do a committee if they want, and they can do that in private. Same with the superintendent. But for us to take up school board meeting time every time to appeal these things would become pretty onerous. So I think we need to make it clear that we're not necessarily going to accept every appeal. I would, I would suggest that. Make it sort of like a Supreme Court model where they only accept so many appeals. So for, in the case of the Supreme Court, it's four of the justices have to agree to hear an appeal for them to actually hear it. So just shy of a majority. So I'd say the same for us, where at least two of us need to agree to hear the appeal. Otherwise, the superintendent's decision stands. That's interesting point why two and why not three why not the majority i just think having a little bit lower bar than a majority would be preferable just so that if you know if at least two people feel strongly that it should be heard then it gets heard an interesting point thoughts on that did, did everybody understand what mr rolls is saying in other words adopt the same process that the supreme court does not to work at that level by any means but that we may decide not to hear it based on a whole lot of issues and it would be a vote of at least two members of the school board to decide whether we would hear that issue or simply let it stand the way the superintendent decided. I'm sure Dr. Wright could write that in such a way if that's the feeling of the school board. I have a thought about that, but let me hear from others first. Let's hear yours first. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Hoover, I can tell you want to say something. Go ahead. I kind of disagree because that's kind of why we're in this position is to look at those, you know, and make the final decision. So I, I think that we should still hear them. I can see both sides. I can see where people can keep just kind of stepping over the superintendent or the principal. And, but I also see what Kathy's saying that it, it is our job and, and it still gives the right of the parent to appeal things. We don't want to take that away from them. But I do see Matt's point of maybe voting on it to see if we have that issue. I don't even know if we've ever had an issue where it was too much <laughs> coming at us, to be honest. So I like the idea, to be honest with you. I just don't know if it's necessary. Mr. Frank, did you have a thought on this? I'm not sure it's necessary either at this point. Uh, I think that we as a school board, uh, the citizens put us here to make these decisions. So 
Couldn't quite hear the last, last part. Yeah, I, I think he said that, uh, well, go ahead, repeat it. You turned away from the mic at the last second, Mr. Frank. I think the uh, people of the community put us here to make those decisions, so I should, I think we should be making that decision. My thought is, um, did you want to respond to that first, Mr. Rule? Well, I agree that we need to make a decision, uh, but it's practically speaking, if at least two of us, there are at least two of us who are, think there's some value to either changing the decision of the superintendent or adding to it, then there's probably not going to be a change made anyways, and there's not a reason to take up more time to do it. My thought in this is that um, sometimes when we, when we make decisions in response to a, a current or particular situation, we're not thinking about the history or even the possible future, that that can be a mistake. What I mean by that is, Right now, there's a possibility of, and could have happened and may still, that the school board may end up having several hearings and related to this book issue that's going on. But I, I think in the last several years, it's probably been rare that it has gone all the way up the chain to the um, school board to have to make that decision. And I'm not so sure it's gonna happen necessarily in the future. So. I think if this was a real issue that it would take way too much of our time from now on, then I think you have a very valid point. But I do also agree with Mr. Frank that at this point, I don't necessarily think outside of a particular issue we're in now that uh, it will necessarily happen that often. And I believe that the community really looks to us to be making those final decisions. So I would respectfully um, disagree uh, understanding the current climate that we're in now. Go ahead. It does sound like then that at least two of you would want to hear it, so then it, it would be a non-issue because then we would be hearing them all, right? With the school, <laughs> with the school board, but we have to remember that any policy that's made goes beyond the five of us that are here, because in two years, two of us are going to change, M may change. Sorry, <laughs> mm -hmm. but yes, I, you know, with this current school board, I, yeah, you're right. But again, policy goes beyond just us. Any other thoughts on that? Okay, we need to kind of, do we want to, um, my vote would be not to include that. Of course, we're not taking a vote on this, I'm sorry. My idea would be to, this other changes that were suggested that Dr. Wright and Dr. Rolls, excuse me, Mr. Rolls made was very valid. But this particular thing, I would disagree with them, but I'm one member, so I'd like to hear from all of you in terms of Mr. Rolls' suggestions of allowing only two board members to decide whether we would hear it or not. Mr. Frank? Yes, I disagree. Ms. Davis? I agree with you. I agree that right now it's not necessary. The temperature is, I think it's, it would be upsetting to many people to do that right now. Ms. Hoover? I agree with Mr. Frank. Okay, yeah, I agree too. I think uh, we don't need to do that at this time, although that is a very um, a very good thought and issue possibly in the future. Let's see what happens. I would say that if if over the next, say, year or six months, we see this happens and it is just overwhelming us, I'd like to come back and visit it with what you're talking about. Okay. Now, uh, just one point of clarification. Uh, you said ahead. like to decide whether we're here or not, and it's it's really not too good to get this side. It would take four board members saying to not hear it for us not to hear it. So okay. we would hear it. All right. Um, but one final okay. change that I had. Uh, just right now, the last sentence reads: "Decisions regarding public complaints and challenges should be made in writing to the complainant." And I would just tack on to the end of that, and will be made available to help provide guidance on what is and is not deemed appropriate for use in King George County Schools. I think I missed some words there, so be made available to the appropriate personnel, essentially, because we're going to be using these decisions to inform future, if it was books, it would be to inform future book purchases, because the ideal would be if it's an occur recurring theme like that, that we can learn from these decisions and eventually maybe not have so many appeals about similar things, so we'll have that body of knowledge to inform future decisions at right. four levels. 
Would it also be appropriate maybe to put a timeline on that so it's not open-ended for months, like, I don't know, seven days or 10 days or something like that? And we've had two comments on all this. Um, any other thoughts? Is there currently a time frame on it? There is not a there is not a time frame, and I would I would just because this is a general format. I think you know our our goal is a, is a, we try to respond to emails promptly. We try to deal with complaints as they come in. We try to to work through these things, but I would not want to put a time limit on it just because. You just don't know what's coming down the pike. Kind of like the more the more we structure it, the more then we then we're held to it. And I felt like that's kind of right now we're sort of held to some things that we we know don't work uh, currently with with current KLB. It's very specific regarding um, guidelines and so forth that that we are clearly see don't work. So. We're trying to, to make sure that when complaints come in, then the superintendent or the principal, depending on which direction it goes, has a little bit of freedom to address the problem in a way that makes the most sense, uh, rather than being confined to a procedure that in this situation or, or a situation five years from now, that this doesn't make sense, which is what we're in right now. Thank so, you for your opinion, Dr. Wright. Thanks. Other thoughts on that, as far as the time limit, Mr. Frank? I think uh, I, when I think of a time limit, to me that puts more pressure um, on the people, superintendent, principal, um, school board, whatever. And I'm, it's um, almost as if the more detail that we put into this, then it's like that is more of the micromanaging. And also I think it takes away some of the ability to respond in a way and say, oh, I gotta do this now. And maybe poor decisions would be made if they have a constraint of time. So I would not be in favor of necessarily putting a timeline on this, although I understand the concern. Um, other thoughts about a timeline? We'll talk about the future stuff in a second too. But I mean, any thought, more thoughts about the timeline? I had a similar thought to Hoover and um, thought about it. And um, for that, thinking more along the lines of Dr. Wright that we should give flexibility. But if, if we did have a timeline, how see time is important. We want to make sure we're being expeditious. Uh, but if, if we did have one, I would prefer to see it in regulation right. you know, from the superintendent. All right. Now, here, your second concern, or actually it was your first one, about uh, writing something about the future. Uh, I personally feel as though this right here, I mean, there may be things that may involve from then on or future or other things that may need to be done. But I think that, uh, again, uh, I don't think we need to necessarily write that. I think that is assumed um, in the writing to the complainant. But that's my opinion. Other thoughts about that, Mr. Rolls? Yeah, that was just my response. Any thoughts about Mr. Rolls' original idea, Ms. Hoover? All right, Mr. Rolls, go ahead. Sure so you're saying the future? No, no. What, what did you, originally I thought you were saying that you wanted to add a statement for this is before you mentioned about the time. You wanted to add something at the end of this last sentence. Right. So why are you talking about the future? I'm making well, what was it that you want? I thought you were referring. What did you want to add? Well, you're now saying that we need to provide the decision right to the person who made the complaint. But I'm saying it should also be provided to the appropriate school staff if it basically was a um, complaint about a decision they made so they have the benefit of that information when they're making future decisions. So to apply to a specific example, it'd be if these, obviously right now we're looking at the appeals about some books. So whatever decision is made about the books, I think those decisions in writing should be provide to whoever made the decisions to purchase those books so they can be aware of the final decision there so they can apply that to future decisions to hopefully not run into the same issue again. That's what I meant about future. <laughs> okay. um, so like the complainant ahead. and the defendant should be notified is what he's saying. I, I, I can see that. But I feel like it is a given at the same time. I'm, I hope that they are informed, yeah. Other thoughts? I believe that this is, is there any reason why they wouldn't be informed? You believe that this pretty, is pretty standard when a response would come out, it would have included everybody involved and it's been working and this decision would be included in that, in that definitely. Yeah, I think that's what I assumed also. 
So why do we need to assume? Why can't we just say it explicitly? So there's, that doesn't hurt to add it, is what you're saying. I understand. Or not. Or not. But again, thoughts on that? Go ahead, Ms. I Davis. I feel like if, if we're saying move forward, it's moving forward. It has to be accepted. As long as the complainant is being notified, that's most important because they're the ones that made the request. His, what he's proposing is just like a, a suggestion, and but I think it should be left. I think he wrote it well. It's fine. I agree. I think that there's, I think this is good enough. I do believe that everybody will be informed. I, I mean, I trust Dr. Wright, or excuse me, it would be in this case either the administration or the superintendent that he would absolutely inform others. And Dr. Boyd, would you weigh in on this a little bit? There you go. I think I'm on now, even though I'm losing my voice. So I think it is important that we write a policy today that's going to be effective for tomorrow. And it's going to be one that we can imply to not only what we're thinking about in our minds today, it's one that we can use for any issue that comes to fruition tomorrow. So I totally appreciate, and I've worked with Dr. Wright on this, the, the, the generalness of it. I know we want to drill down to specifics. The more specific we get, the less effective it's going to be moving forward when it gets into challenging issues that don't necessarily fit into that mold today. I think the idea of informing our staff, well, that, that's what we do every day. I mean, as we're working through and be trying to become better uh, at, at our jobs and, and really as a division and grow our capacity, we're constantly reflecting and constantly trying to improve upon, you know, today's effort tomorrow. So uh, I think those things are certainly implied. I agree. <clears throat> so I would like to keep it like it is, uh, unless um, I know you heard Mr. Rolls board, I'd like to keep it like it is. Any other thoughts on that? No, Mr. Chairman, I, I agree. Uh, I think we need to be really careful that we're not micromanaging uh, the people here. Good. Any other thoughts? Okay, well, Listening to the will of the board, Dr. Wright, I think you, those other changes at the beginning, I think are valid. So if you'd make those and then next time, let's look at that as a, a possible uh, action item. If we need to have more discussion on it, of course, we won't have to have an action on it, but I think we have enough to maybe make a decision at the next uh, board meeting. All right, uh, let's go on to the KLB-E, Dr. Wright. All right. Or F. I don't know which actually, one you first. I actually had KLF. That's, that's fine. Okay. Go ahead. So the second revision in your packet is going to fall under form KLF, public complaints form general, is the title of it. So we just have two uh, minor revisions. The first revision to this form would be the addition of requesting the relation of the complainant to the school division to include the three categories of parent guardian, resident, and or employ and then they would check all that apply so that's the first revision and then down at the bottom the second and third actually the three revisions the second and third revisions are at the bottom of the form uh, directing parents and guardians to return the form to the principal of the building where the concern originated and for and for residents without children enrolled in the school system to return the form to the superintendent's office so this is um, this form already exists. It falls under K, K L. Uh, it's right after that under the form. And we just want to use this as a catch all uh, form, which I'll, I'll cover the purpose for that is because K L E is the form which is next that we would like to, to remove. So well, go ahead. why don't you just go to K L E then and we'll discuss both of them together. Okay, so we'll go ahead and flip over to K L E, which is the next one. This is the current form that we have under KL, KLBE. So KLBE is an exhibit or a form, um, but that's what the E stands for. And we have stricken this proposed that we delete this and just use KLF. And really the purpose for this is we have now two forms that really are doing the same. Uh, so um, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll read what I wrote because I don't want to leave anything out. Uh, for KLBE, which is Request for recon Reconsideration of the Learning Resources, we want that to be deleted 
and it's in its place will be KLF, the public complaint form. Uh, this will provide more of an all-encompassing and more open-ended form for complainants. Um, lastly, any form of communication, which I think is important, which would be an email, a phone call, a verbal conversation, or a handwritten note, all of those concerns are valid and we, we respond to them all, regardless of how they come to us. So having forms, or even in this case, now we have two forms that are basically doing the same thing. If we can remove any redundancy, uh, I think that would be a very practical um, suggestion. So in this case, we're combining two complaint forms into one, but my point is most people don't use forms. They just come up and call us, they tell us, they write it down in an email, and those are all binding, and we respond to those just like we respond to something that comes on a form. So I just wanted to make that point clear. All right, any questions about this form or about the two forms, eliminating one and just using the other? Well, just where it says relations there to, uh, to the school division, parent, can we put a slash guardian? Right now we just got parent guardian. Yes, thank you. Good suggestion. Others? I think it does make sense to combine them and just have one form. Thanks, Dr. Wright, for, for working on that. Appreciate it. Other thoughts? I love it. It's super simplified. The only thing, I, um, and it has nothing to do with, I just feel like I need to let my community know that we're at the bottom where it says parents guardian with it, currently enrolled students and then King George residents without currently enrolled students. That is not about what we've heard about they don't have a right to say this or that it has nothing to do with that. It has taken off the burden, taken the burden off some of our principles. And that's what it's about, that you still have just as much of a voice in the community. That's a good point. And of course, like we just said previously in the whole policy itself of KLB is that um, if it does have to do with a specific school, the superintendent would immediately just refer them to the principal. Yeah. So it really doesn't change it. It's simplified, it's efficient, and that's what needs to be the other one looking at it was just like kind of a nightmare. But good job. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Looks good. All right. Yeah, I believe it looks good too. But um, let's include this with the uh, action item at the next board meeting. It's just that this one looks good except for the dash or slash. Right. Looks good just like it is. All right. That's it. Thank you, Dr. Wright. Thank you. Appreciate it very much. Appreciate all your effort and your work. I know this is. Uh, been going on for about what three or four weeks almost thank you all right let's move on um, we have the um, schedule of the budget work session now this is not we're going to talk about in the next item C about all the work sessions this is only the budget work session that we're required to do as a school board so uh, to me there's two suggestions really one is that we could have the work session and replace of the next scheduled meeting on the 26th of February or we could schedule a separate work session and just have the 26th of February as a regular meeting. So it's open for discussion. Um, obviously, if we talk about another time or date, it'd be nice to have your calendars out if you have that, but it's open for discussion. First thing is, do you want to simply change the next regular scheduled meeting to a work session? So let's answer that one first. Thoughts? I don't, I'm not sure, Dr. Board, uh, what do we have coming up on the next one? Uh, wait, will there be a need for two meetings or can we handle it at one? So as of right now, <clears throat> the only thing I have on our next school board meeting is our CTE advisory. CTE advisory will present at the next school board meeting. Obviously, some of the things we're discussing this evening will roll in to that next board meeting. But as we discuss it tonight, the agenda is not too long as it stands today. So it could, um, we could postpone, I'm not saying we should, just it could be postponed. Would it be dangerous if we postponed it to the next meeting, which would be on uh, are we February, March? Uh, are, you're referring to postponing like the CTE advisory? Yes. I We could do that. So what's the will of the board? Because we could do a work session, like on the March the 6th, if you wanted to, instead of, oh, I'm sorry, what? Uh, February 26th, I think. February, yeah. Right now we're talking about, do we want to make the work session February 26th and postpone the regular meeting agenda? Or do we want to 
weekend schedule. But it sounds like we'll have all the information we need from Senate and delegates to update this to discuss. So I don't see any reason why not to just do it. To save it on the 26th, 26th right? as a work session? I'm right about that, right, Dr. Boyle? We'll, we'll have, you'll have everything to present by February 26th, right? That's enough time? I, I believe so, yes. I believe by February 18th, we'll have much more information. That'll give us uh, and my staff the week of February 18th to ideally update the budget to include the Senate and delegate versions, which would be good timing for the 26th. I agree. I think the budget is such a big deal and we need to work on this as quickly as we can so that we can get that information to the Board of Supervisors so they'll have time. Um, and also, just an idea, if we do make February 26th a budget work session, we could still talk within these next couple of weeks of maybe having March 6th as a regular board meeting if things come up that we need to meet about. <clears throat> we don't need to make that decision tonight. The decision we do need to make is the budget work session. Mr. Chair, yes. also if you look at page five of the total packet, which is the uh, timeline that Dr. Boyd presented for doing all this yes. budget stuff. Yes. Uh, I was talking about us approving the budget by the first week of March. So I, I don't really like the idea of having the uh, work session the same day that we approve it. Like, I'd like to have some space between the work session and approving the budget. So, hence, I think what well, I think it's at the end of February would be ideal. But you still like the idea of the 26 being the work session. Right. Your question is, Dr. Boyd's um, maybe not approving it. And my point is that if we're going to approve it by the beginning of March, according to this schedule, and then we need to do the work session at the end of February, especially if we're not trying to approve it the same day we're doing the, the work session. That's a good point. We can discuss that at the work session. I think that's a, you have a very valid point, Mr. Rolls, and I think that's something we can discuss at the work session. Did you have an input with that, Dr. Boyd? No, I'm just thinking that same evening on the 26th, we're also required to have a public hearing. We could do that as well on that evening. The work session and public hearing at the same time? We need to have the public hearing. Oh, I know that. Yeah, sooner than later. So, in fact, I think um, we have to have it on that 26th in order for us to stay on, on time. And really following the budget presentation, that's a perfect opportunity for everyone to weigh in on any, anything in the community that they wanna talk about as it pertains to budget. So it's just like public comment where they would come and we just have individual public comment based on the budget as opposed to anything else that evening. Okay, so we'd have a <clears throat> work, budget work session and the public hearing on the same day. Yes, sir. And we would start with public comment yeah. and provide uh, the public hearing. And again, in the past, it's been very, it's been, we open a public hearing for the, for the budget, we take any public comment, we close public comment for the budget, and then we, we could have the work session following that. I see where that's valuable. I see one issue, and that is, let's say we hear things in the um, public, they make comments, and then we have the work session and we make changes to the budget, then it's almost as if we got to go back to the public again. Well, that'll keep happening all the way up until, <laughs> okay. that, that'll, that, if you remember last year, that'll, yes, that'll, that'll con even after we have the work session, things will continue to change. Right. We'll, we'll, we'll receive our uh, health care update. Right. right. Uh, we'll, we'll receive a number of changes. points yeah. of information. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. All right. So what I understand is then we're going to change the uh, meeting on uh, February the 26th to both be the public hearing and then also the work budget work session. We're all okay with that? Mm -hmm. Still starting at six o'clock? So March 26th, February, no, February 26th. February 26th, yes. That's it's gonna be today. public hearing and then work, and the work session, session and then possibly March 6th. Well, then we'll talk about dates at, at the work session. We'll discuss that. Okay. Because that's a that's a discussion. It also depends on where we are. Dr. Boyd's going to have a whole lot more things that will be coming available, and so let's um, we'll have that discussion at the work session. Okay. All right. I believe that would require a motion and a vote. Not positive, but I'm pretty sure it will. Let's do it anyway. A motion. We're going to change the regular meeting on February the 26th to be the public hearing and the budget work session. 
I make a motion that we change our February 26th meeting to a public hearing and a budget work session in lieu of a school board meeting. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Chair votes aye, motion carries. Dr. Boyd, if you'd make those changes, appreciate it. All right, work session goals. The only reason this could be a quick discussion. Mr. Oh, Chair. Yes. Can we discuss further details of the budget work session. Uh, do we want this for format? We're going to do it like we have in the past. Where we're still all sitting at a table like this, side by side. We're sitting around a table facing well, each like other. I like the idea of sitting around. Yeah, that's a good point. But I like the idea of sitting in a round table, similar to what we did last year when we had the joint meeting. Yeah. Well, no, even before that, when we had the board training, when someone came in, you remember we sat around a table. I think, yeah, I think that's a better way to do it. Yeah, we'll we'll set that up, Dr. Boyd. That's yes, not sir. a problem. And probably still keep microphones and record it just for the ease of yes, minutes. yes, 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 yes. Yeah. We'll still record it. So, and I'm, will the Rivercombe building be available? I believe so. Right, I believe we have a schedule for that. Okay, and then we'll also discuss even at the beginning after we hear that since it's a public hearing about the budget, we'll have that um, comments first, and then we can even uh, um, we'll have an, a little agenda about how we'll make some discussion, the items that we'll need to make sure we have clarified. There'll be information Dr. Boyd will present. We'll have that all written down so we can all have access to it, plus our books. And any questions that you may have about this, that'll give us two weeks to look and study this whole budget. And any further questions between now and the budget work session, please feel free to contact Dr. Boyd because we need to get a lot of those on the table, okay? All right, let's move on. Okay, um, I simply put um, work session goals, um, and what I meant by that is if you wanted to, we talked last time about I actually have some dates, and I was thinking we might at least schedule after the budget work session. If you want, we could postpone this for another time, but I was thinking it might be valuable to have, um, to actually choose at least one other work session besides our regular meetings in which we would discuss some of those five goal, well, five goals that we had, such as cell phone and so on. Do you want to look at scheduling, say, a Saturday morning or another time when we could have these this work session to discuss at least um, some of our five goals? Yeah. Comments? Um, yes. So we like that idea? Okay, so what we're looking at now, does everybody have their calendars out? Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Rolls, do you have a comment about that? Do we like that idea? And I the idea, the idea that we would schedule at least one um, work session, board work session, to begin to discuss our five goals. The first one, and I think right at the top, would be the cell phones. And we may, I would suggest that when we do even this first one, if we finish the discussion of the cell phone pretty quickly, we might go on to one of the other top um, goals that we had in our, for the board for the year. Right now, I would say let's choose a date to have that and definitely include the discussion of the cell phones and then one of the other four goals that are remaining if we have time. And, and just for information, Mr. Chair, we are pulling together our committees at the school level as it pertains right. to the cell phone conversation. So we're planning on um, actually had a pretty good meeting today within the next couple of weeks, scheduling a few committee meetings, uh, probably towards the end of February, beginning of March as it pertains to any feedback you would want to solicit from the committee at, for cell phones? <clears throat> Mr. Chair, my, my thought yes. was actually that we should try to make a plan for cell phones first since we had the most agreement on that one. Right. But um, I was thinking we wouldn't do the work session until after we had the results from the committee, just so we can make that the most profitable. I think that's what Dr. Boyd was just talking about. So when are you thinking that would he, he just mentioned him, when that would be ready? I'm hoping again, it's so there's there's roughly ten to fifteen people that that are from different stakeholder groups. So I met with a small group today, and we're going to push out some possible dates. Typically, when you're talking about a stakeholder group like that, that's a challenging group to get together. So that's my only concern right now, but I'm hoping that we can schedule two to three meetings between the end of February, beginning of March. We've got four weeks right now before we dismiss for spring break. So I'm really kind of hoping that 
uh, we can get the lion's share of that work done before then. I was actually looking at March 11th, Monday. First day of spring break. Yeah. What was the date? It's March 11th. It is the first day of spring break. It may not be a good time. Actually, Dr. Boyd will probably be gone. I know. I'm. That's uh, fine by me. I mean, it'll, it'll just be me there. My staff will be on break, but of I, I course, can certainly I understand be there. that. Yeah. But I, I don't want to. Obviously, I don't want to impose on board members. I'm just thinking we could make it the next one. That's available for me. It doesn't mean it's available for the rest of you. Thoughts? My only thought is if he's not going to have all of his his uh, stakeholder meetings until the end of March. Would we want to meet prior to that? Isn't that what we said, the end of March, before you would have? No, no, he said end of February. This would be after that, yeah. Okay. He said end of February, beginning of March. Oh, you said February, okay. Yeah, hopefully, and again, it, it's a factor of whether or not everybody can get together, and I'll keep you guys in the loop on those okay. conversations. Well, do you want to make that then a tentative work session on Monday, the 11th of March, 6 o'clock? Mr. Rolls, I can tell you. As I look through this, I was, thinking we'd actually put, put off the cell phone one, not make that first, just to give right. the committee enough time to do everything. Yeah, so I actually thought we would wonder about, number two in the list was improve, talking about staff morale, and maybe we hit that one first, just to give well, enough time. I was to saying at the beginning, we would do the cell phone one first, as long as everything is ready. And then if we finish that discussion and we still have time, yes, we can go into one of the other four, which would be morale, uh, bullying, uh, religious freedom and parental involvement. Um, I don't know about the uh, priorities of those, but we all agreed cell phone was the number one priority. Um, do you want to discuss what would be the second one we might cover that same night? Is that what you're referring to, Mr. Rolls? Right, I'm referring, we'll pick our second priority to do okay. first right. before the cell phone since the committee is going to take some time. Well, he said that they'll probably be ready, but I understand your point. Hopefully they will be. All right, do we have a second uh, priority, which would be morale, uh, bullying, religious freedom, and parental involvement? Which one of those four would we want to put up near the top? I would think either morale or bullying, one of the two. So we have a thought of morale and bullying? Yeah, so I know you're trying to combine different ideas for different folks. And so the morale one, I think my more specific a statement there was that before we start doing all these different goals that have the potential to add more on the staff, that we would do the morale one first, because more specifically there, I was wanting to know about ideas for things that we could take away that, that aren't really value added to relieve some burden before we start discussing other things. So let's do that one first, was my thinking. Do the morale one first. Right, so we're focused mostly, at least a big part of that would be focused on what kind of things can we take off their plate? Okay, oh, morale. Yeah, yeah, sure. So morale, are you all right with that? Yes. Yeah. Morale, all right, that's good. So assuming we'll be ready with the cell phone, that'll be the first thing. Second thing will be morale. All right, and then that will be on um, March the 11th. Okay, March the 11th, six o'clock. We'll see what's available. Again, we'd like a table, same thing we talked about the budget workshop, maybe a round table whether it's maybe in one of the schools or Rivercombe or whatever. If you could let us know, Dr. Boyd. Yeah, question. Okay, go ahead, Mr. Rolls. So for Dr. Boyd, now you said you'd be already March 11th, but uh, so when we talk about cell phones, are you not envisioning having some members of the committee there to talk to us as well? Uh, I, I'm not sure. Not on the first, it's too early to tell. I need to get a lot of information from this committee. I think it would probably be beneficial for us to chew on some of that information from the committee okay. before, and I, I can certainly present that. I'm going to be a big participant in this committee. Um, I think it's a good group of stakeholders that will get a, a lot of positive feedback that I'll be able to present on, but I think it's a little early to tell about what moving parts we'll have at, at the committee meeting as it relates to this, um, our policy initiatives. And that's three and a half weeks away, so you'll be able to email us into those yeah. meetings. Okay, good. I did, uh, I was going to do this in the board uh, at the end, but that one comment about, I don't remember anybody rolling their eyes because obviously we've watched. Oh, yeah, I, I didn't want to address I that. I have no idea what he, but, but anyway, I don't think any of us are rolling. We love the idea. In fact, maybe that was the response because I went, I went like, I raised my eyes because I thought it was a great idea. You have to hear from the <clears throat> students. Anyway, I don't think we need to say anymore. I think there was a misunderstanding there. 
All right, let's move on then. Okay, so we've got two things. We got the budget work session done along with the public hearing on the 26th. And then we have the uh, 11th of March, which is a Monday, uh, doing the uh, cell phone and then also morale. All right, moving the closed session. This is a discussion item. We could move it to a motion, but right now it's discussion. Mr. Chair, I'm not clear what you said there. So you say you want to do both those topics on March 11th? No, we would do the cell phone first. If we finish that one, we'll do morale. Did I miss something? So it sounds like we weren't really sure. I mean, because if you if we want to have committee members there, they're not going to be there on the 11th, right? Because it's spring break. They're not going to. Right. So I guess it sounds like. I think she needs to. Yeah, I was going to say, I go ahead, Mr. Frank. I don't see a need for all the staff to be there. He said, I don't see a need for the, any of the staff to be there necessarily. I think that we can get a lot of their comments and a lot of their, their, you know, how they feel about all these things from Dr. Boyd. I would trust that he will bring all of this. You know, we had two students that said this. We had a teacher who said this. I trust Dr. Boyd that he'll bring all that to us. Also, we're advertising it. So if anybody wants to come, it's an open Absolutely. meeting. Absolutely. So they can Absolutely. come and be there if they want. I'm just wondering if it wouldn't be simpler just to make do one of the other ones first and then have that later, but so that we don't worry about it. I would like experience. to see the cell phone one first. That's personally. Other board members. So, so Mr. Rolls, I clarified um, with Dr. Boyd that because I thought the committees weren't going to have been finished meeting till the end of March, but they'll be done by the end of February, so he will have lots of their feedback then. I think that's, is that maybe why you're confused? And even the first week in March too, so you'd have, right. it's basically three, almost a month. Right, so we keep saying the same stuff, but I mean, I know it'll be done, but I mean, there's always a lot of value, I think, hearing directly from people, even though I know Dr. Boy would have collected it all and repeated it as best he could, but yeah, I think it's, if people want to be here from directly, I know that they're going to discuss that and decide what the best way to do is to do it, it will be. Um, but just give us the flexibility to have that option if that's what they decide they want to do, if we delayed it a little bit. Okay, so let's let's move on then. So we're planning on the 11th of March right now. And as long as everything is ready, we'll have the cell phone discussion first and then morale. All right, moving the closed session. <clears throat> Thoughts? <laughs> I, I I believe we discussed this last meeting that we yeah. were going to come prepared to vote on it today. I guess I'm confused. No, I, I agree. It was a discussion item. Um, I, I just, where we're going to put it. I think we all agreed in a discussion we were going to definitely move it up. I think the only, and I, I think I wrote it here that we said it would be right after the presentations, the budget presentation, the closed session would be right there. Um, but I'm willing to entertain if you want it in a different place. And yes, I would think we would vote on it tonight. I think that's a good spot for it personally, but I'm not I'm not opposed to a different spot. Others? I just want to add, Mr. Chair, I, I spoke with um, a number of folks. We've put it in different places in the past. So Cheryl has a historical knowledge of oh, this. Oh, good, thank yes. you. <laughs> so um, after presentations is a pretty good spot. It's It's one that's going to provide um, a natural break in our meeting. If you notice, usually at that point of time, it gives out everybody an Not opportunity tonight. to step away. Uh, and, and it's um, far enough up the agenda so that everybody doesn't have to stay here all night to, to participate in everything. I think after presentations is, is an ideal spot, if, for my humble opinion. Okay, if we don't have any further discussion, do I have a motion? I make a motion to move the closed meeting portion of the agenda to following the presentation in the future. That's fine. That's it's okay. On. It's on. Now it's on. <laughs> I will now, now it's on. <laughs> it just don't like you. It's off now. <laughs> Mr. Frank seconds the motion. <laughs> Any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Chair votes aye. Motion carries. The closed sessions will now be following the presentation from now on. All right. Um, next is the committee reports. This is committee reports. I have Mr. none. 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 
Mr. Frank, committee report, CTE, no? Davis, Commit no. the committee you're on? Yeah, not yeah. yet. My first one's coming up, so. Okay. Um, but I, yeah. Go ahead. Did you have a committee? Report? I do plan on reaching out to the prior one on this, on my committee with the Chesapeake Bay Governor School to um, gather some insight because she'd been on it for a long time. Excellent idea. Excellent. Yeah. All right. Um, I don't really have a full committee report, but um, I am on that uh, ATI committee, which is also called the Lab School. And we did have a, um, a meeting. Dr. Boyd and myself had a meeting with Dr. Towery about a week ago. And um, just some more concerns about um, making sure that she was prepared to actually start the year in terms of curriculum, in terms of staff, and also in terms of there was another gentleman, and I keep forgetting his name, uh, Michael Bowen. And Michael Bowen, thank you. And um, I was afraid that at, at the beginning when she was making presentations, he'd been through this and he'd actually started this type of school in the past. And she assured me that he is still involved. And it's very good to have an expert, uh, an expert that has had the experience of doing this. And so, yeah, I was very satisfied with what Dr. Tower is doing, although it is still a tremendous amount, especially with somebody that had never started a school. Uh, but it was nice to, to visit with her and I felt very positive about it. Mr. Chairman. Yes. I almost forgot, <laughs> but we, you and I went to the school, the ROTC debate, which was amazing. Well, we can do that at the Oh, that's board. not now? Yes. Oh, okay. That's okay. It's okay. <laughs> You're fine, Ms. Davis. All right. Next is the 2A procedures. Um, this was a little bit of the discussion about um, some of the concerns that we heard in public comment tonight is um, what are the procedures that we are going to do in terms of um, these books? that are currently of concern. Um, and obviously we have it very clear about um, if a parent wants to opt out, I think that's been made clear. But now also, what do we do with the current books that are there? And what do we wanna do with um, this whole concept of, should they be moved to a, a separate place? Um, a restricted access, should they be kept there and simply parents can opt out when they see that they don't want their son or daughter reading this type of book? So this is, um, and this is mostly in the procedure category administration. So I would first like to hear from Dr. Boy. Yes, sir, Mr. Chair. So I appreciate the opportunity. Um, I, I heard a whole lot tonight and have a lot of personal feelings. I'm gonna try to stay away from, the, from those in these comments. Uh, not to sound unsympathetic, I can tell you that uh, this has been a, a topic of conversation in circles that I've been in for, many, many months now. And uh, I can tell you that I've, I've learned a lot uh, and I'm not gonna go into all the, what I've learned because it's, it's a very lengthy and long conversation, but I just do wanna say on the front end that I am very sympathetic to, to everyone's needs as it pertains to working through these issues. I wanna thank everybody that has come out tonight, everybody that has worked tirelessly from our librarians to, uh, our school board office staff, to our principals, to uh, everyone involved, school board members. This is really a challenging issue for our community. And it's one that I think uh, many communities are experiencing right now. And I do feel like we are attempting to blaze a path forward that, that is very considerate of, of all sides of this argument. So uh, specifically speaking, policies and procedures uh, for IIA moving forward. So where we are, if you remember, we updated policy IIA. Uh, policy IIA is instructional materials. We included library books. We thought it was very important to include library books because policy IIA was one that was given to us, I think a year, year and a half ago from the Yonkin administration. And it was one that was very uh, wisely written, I believe, that empowered parents in these conversations. So I think that's a, a pillar to, to our decision. We need to make sure that we put parents in the driver's seat. We need to make sure that we allow parents to make these decisions for their children. I can tell you one of the epiphanies that we've all come to is that regardless of how much we debate these conversations, I can promise you that we will all have different opinions on some of these concepts. And so empowering parents to make these decisions for their, for their students is, is extremely important. So number one, procedures is to empower our parents. Um, we do now have on our website 
a uh, sexually explicit list posted. So for our community members still listening, if you go to our King George County Schools webpage, you go to departments, you navigate to the instruction uh, tab. <clears throat> On the left-hand side of that page, you'll see a sexually explicit materials uh, link that you can click on. That is our current and very fluid list of materials that we have deemed to be sexually explicit. They include a lot of books, a lot of classic books, a lot of classic works of art, um, which all do, quite frankly, fall under the definition of sexually explicit. That list is current, although that list will continue to grow and be revised. The other thing that's happening right now is I've worked with and our principals are working with our librarians. They are actually waiting for us to come up with some uh, conclusions on some policy related issues, but they are working on a very good working document on the selection uh, process for books moving forward. And I've shared some of those drafts with you guys. Uh, so I think we're gonna shore up that process on selecting books. We've got some information in that document that our librarians have put together on uh, a process called the weeding out of books, books that don't uh, really meet the mustard of circulation, they're not being checked out, books that uh, we feel, uh, whether it's school administration, whether it's school librarians, we feel should just be removed from the library. So that document is a working document, one that will be finalized here very shortly. As it pertains to the policy for IIA and sexually explicit materials in the classroom, by policy, we are required to notify parents. Uh, that comes in the form of the list I just described online. That has traditionally come in the form of, on the high school level, like a notice on the syllabus uh, or any information that's sent home. At that point, parents have the opportunity to make a decision as it pertains to their child. I would like my child to read this book, or I would not like my child to read this book. And then if the choice is not to, they would have an alternative assignment that they could do in lieu of reading that book. That happens on the instructional side right now. On the library side, we have identified books that would be considered sexually explicit if they remain in our libraries. Some of them may not. If they remain in our libraries, then we have designated a location by the circulation desk where those where those books would reside, working with our, our school librarians. Um, <clears throat> just like policy IIA, if parents decide they would like to opt their child out, this is not new. This is something we've done in school for many, many years for sensitive topics. Uh, family life education is one that comes to mind. There's many processes and procedures in public school for many years now that parents have had the opportunity to opt out on. This is under those same policies and premises. Uh, parents would have the opportunity to uh, designate that they would opt out of any sexually explicit library books. These books would be in the library behind the circulation desk. If by chance a student comes into the library and says, I'd like to check out a book that is found on our list that you can reference online, the librarian would be able to see whether or not a parent designated their opting their child out. <clears throat> if there's any question at all, if there's no if there's no opt out, then the parent the librarian can simply contact that parent before the child checks the book out, email, phone call, whatever it may be, uh, and just have a good old fashioned conversation with a parent and say, hey, this is the book. If you want to take a look at it and review it, it's fine. Um, and then you can make a decision based on that information. So right now, I think we have policies and practices in place that consider the selection of books moving forward. Uh, it really solidifies policy IIA as one that puts parents in the driver's seat and allows them to make decisions for their child's own education. Uh, it also provides parents the opportunity um, for alternative assignments, it really gives them a number of avenues that they can explore if they would um, like to choose an alternative route. So uh, with that, I'll stop right there and answer any questions that uh, the board may have on our, our policies and procedures moving forward. <clears throat> Dr. Boyd, thank you very much. <clears throat> that was, uh, I know there's been an anguish in your department, 
in your work, the librarians, the teachers, and everything else, and I appreciate all the work that's done. I'll hold my comments and opinions and hear from the other board members first. So thoughts and opinions. I'm so sorry. Not working. It's not working. Oh, there it is. No. Oh. Um, Mr. Frank's mic, for some reason, is shorting out or not working or something. Why don't you use the student? Because it's kind of important, Mr. Frank, because this is recorded. I don't have any questions right now. I just want to thank Dr. Boyd for all the work that he has done on the uh, presentation he just gave us. I think is uh, is really good. Uh, so, and I'm, I'm, I know the work that you have put into it and the staff that put into it. I just want to thank you for that. Ms. Davis? I don't have one right now. I might in a few minutes, but I don't right now. Ms. Hoover? Thank you. I think that your solution will hopefully satisfy the majority. Um, so I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Rolls? Yeah, I'll also say thank you. I know obviously doing that the whole board, uh, budget presentation was a lot of work on itself, but then to have all this book controversy on top of it at the same time, sure there's a lot of pressure and time pressure and otherwise on you and your staff. So thank you for thank you. working on all this. I will say that I think obviously there's a lot of passion and interest in this topic. So uh, I think ultimately I see us needing to go a little beyond what we have in the policy right now, more than I think we want to actually all discuss here at, at the board. So I think a regulation to IIA is probably what makes the most sense down the road. I know you're still working on a lot of details, but <laughs> then that gives people the details they want to know and it'll be publicly posted for anybody to see. So that's kind of where I see it going. One other comment for uh, getting the book up on book list on the website. Thank you very much for that. One thing I, I do notice looking at it is that there's quite the variety of, of books on there. Uh, so my concern is that some people might look at that and see a book like Hamlet and be like, that's ridiculous. They don't have all this innocuous stuff on here. So I think it might be good to acknowledge on the front of any page that it's not just sexually explicit material. It's it, There's also maybe just some sexually implicit material there too, just because we're erring on the side of caution to include everything that anybody might interpret as sexually explicit. Yeah, so teachers right now, and, and librarians for that matter, are being very cautious with this because it's a topic of conversation. So we've done a lot of research. You can see a number of lists across the, the Commonwealth right now as it pertains to sexually explicit material. Again, I, I don't want to get into, into the weeds too much. I, I can just tell you, generally speaking, without giving you a whole lot of explanation, Everyone has a different, is as explicit as you want to make that definition, there is still uh, room for subjectivity as it pertains to that definition. Not everybody has the same opinion on what they believe sexually explicit is. And so for that matter, and, and because of where we are in, in trying to design an appropriate policy, our educators right now are in a place where they're, they're being uh, very cautious and very forthcoming with with anything that they think might broach that conversation. Um, and again, I think it's a good thing because ultimately what we're hoping is that through this process, we are notifying, we're engaging, and, and um, hopefully um, uh, involving our parents in this process. And I think that's what this list will do moving forward. You see um, a lot of the, this, the one I always come back to is the, the Statue of David. The Statue of David is, is a naked man. In talking to people <clears throat> that, that have knowledge of what the Statue of David is, uh, they, I, I don't think a lot of people know they do this subconsciously, but they say there's such value in that. It's such great art. And for that reason, I don't weigh it so heavily as being so sexually explicit. But if you were to take another naked person or another naked statue that didn't have that great artistic value, then people would again almost subconsciously determine that the explicitness outweighs the value of the art. We won't be able to do that for everybody. We will not be able to make that decision for everyone. Everyone has to make that decision for themselves. 
again, this is getting a little bit into the weeds, but I think it's why it's important. It's, it's deeply important that we make sure that whatever policies or procedures we push forward, we empower parents to make these decisions as it pertains to their child. So I, th I appreciate that comment. And I have a couple things. First of all, I want to thank you, Dr. Boyd. It's a tremendous amount of work. And I know that's been a lot of discussion. I think the procedures that you're going to be using does several things. Number one, it empowers the parents. I agree with that totally. Number two is I think also it allows teachers to make the decisions. It allows the librarians to make a decision rather than simply, you know, trying to micromanage them. It allows them to make the decision. And some teachers, if they want to put those books because there's only one sentence or one concern, let them do that. Let the teachers decide. And then parents can decide, oh, well, of course it's fine. They won't opt out of most of those things. But putting it, teachers, you make the decision, trusting the teachers. And then the parents have the option to opt out if they wish. In the library, you have the librarian, same kind of thing. I love your idea of they can opt out if they don't want to read them, but some of these books that have been discussed like tonight and read, they're going to be going into an area that um, the students won't have access to, but if they want to, before the librarian would let them, they will, he, she will email or contact the parent, and if they agree, <clears> then she'll allow them to, to read it, just like some of the people were concerned. I, I want them to read it. I want these discussions to go on at home. Well, this allows that to take place. Again, it's putting the responsibility on the parent. And I love that idea. It's not banning any books. However, I love your idea also, and we're going to be looking at this about the procedure of so the selection of books in the future. And also the weeding out, either they're not being checked out for many years or for whatever reasons, or they're being eliminated for various reasons. And I know you're going to be presenting that at a, at a future meeting when you I know you're working on it. You've sent us copies of it, but it's not finished yet. I appreciate that because part of this is, as was mentioned several times in the comments, is how did they get it here in the first place? Mm -hmm. So there is a discussion. We always, this is ongoing. What's our selection process? So I love all those things. I love the idea that we're, we're trusting our teachers and our librarians, that we are giving parents the, uh, uh, the decision as to whether they want to opt in or opt out, really. Uh, we are not simply keeping all those books on the shelves for anybody to go read. There will be an area in the library that they'll have to go and they can check out those books if the parents wish after con contacting the parent. I think that is a, I think it accomplishes almost everything that was mentioned here this evening. Obviously, there'll be some people on both ends of the spectrum that may see this as an alternative for banning books. I understand that. I don't think it is at all because they're still there. And then some will say, well, why are they in the library at all? Well, this allows them, again, their children won't be able to have adult access to those books that they're concerned about. And I love that idea because I would not want my 12-year-old uh, granddaughter in middle school to be able to read some of those books. And so we would opt out of those, obviously. So anyway, I appreciate all this work. I think it does. It's a compromise that I believe as much as possible answers the question and I don't know if any divisions has done something similar, but I appreciate that I believe this does answer the question and hopefully our county will be happy with this. Thank you. Any further discussion on this? You said it perfectly for me. <laughs> all right, good. Let's move on. And all those that were making comments, I hope they listen to this. We'll see. <laughs> all right. Um, superintendent's report. We're coming near the end. <laughs> I've talked a lot tonight. So um, the, the only thing I want to say this, this evening, and I, I, should, I just want to thank everybody uh, that has been working through many of these challenging issues. Uh, we've got a lot of staff members. We've got a lot of school board members, a lot of community members who have weighed heavy into this. Um, I, I just I want to remind everybody that these are very important societal issues that we're dealing with right now. These are issues um, in our world that are, that are very challenging to deal with and very polarized. Uh, coming into this job, and I think all of us coming into these seats, we knew that we were going to deal with these type of issues. I think it's important to compartmentalize them and put them in the right places and deal with them effectively. But probably most importantly, we make sure that it doesn't distract from our child's ability, from our children's ability to get an education. I think that's why we're primarily here. Uh, and, I, and I think 
this generation of students coming off of um, COVID and learning loss and things of that nature, we, we are really in a position where our focus needs to be laser-like on our ability to um, provide the best quality education we can. And I think we're doing that through many of these conversations and many of these issues. But I think it's very important that um, I say that this evening and make sure that we continue to be focused on the children of this community and providing the best education for them that we can. I'm going to stop talking because I can't talk anymore and I've talked enough tonight. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Welcome. <clears throat> All right. Next, we have the board. Funny, I've lost my paper here. Uh, okay, now we have board comments. So this is the time, final comments. Um, so we'll start with Ms. Davis. She wanted to make a couple comments. Did I? Yeah, about the. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Remember, we saw the debate. Oh, this was a lot happening tonight. So, uh, yeah. any, any comments you want to make? So, yes. Um, Mr. Bush and I, and I'll let Kathy talk about her experience, but we got to go to the ROTC debate. They, the kids had, uh, the students did a debate on the schools having the benefits of cell phones and maybe not so benefits of having cell phones in classroom. And it was really, really interesting to see. It's really neat to have teachers such as Mr. Grant out there um, that are concerned and willing to uh, put input and get input from the students. And it meant a lot to the students as well to, um, for us to show up and be there, but also to have a voice in that and, and feel valued in that decision. So it was really a um, cool thing to be a part of. So thank you, Mr. Grant. I almost said Dr. Grant, <laughs> Mr. Grant, Mr. Callahan, sorry. Okay, now we'll go to the student rep. You've been all, you've been patient all night long. And so now's your chance. And I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Please forgive me. It is a uh, Connor Wheaton. Connor, yes, thank you, Connor. Thank you. Um, so I have my report from the King George High School, starting off for education um, for this upcoming Wednesday, February 14th. Um, certain econ and personal finance classes and our mar other marketing classes will conduct a reverse career day where employers from various different businesses across the county and I believe from also in the region as well, will come to the school and view certain um, posters and uh, presentations of students and what their career goals are for their future. And from there, employers would uh, take notes and the students will take um, notes from the employers as well of any advice or any remarks that they have. Moving on, um, uh, for achievements this past week, um, our King George High School wrestling team uh, competed in the Battlefield Districts and finished second. They defeated, um, or sorry, they head to um, Powhatan High School for Class 4 Region B Championships. And with the result of this district, um, at least seven students are qualified for state championships. Um, nextly, uh, the academic team uh, this weekend defeated Phoebus and Jamestown High School, and with this, they are now heading to Division IV state championships. And lastly, for achievements, um, the King George High School swim team over the weekend went to regionals, and uh, where the men's swim ach uh, achieved fourth and women's swim achieve second in the regionals. Um, nextly, events on February 21st, the following week from, the, um, from now, uh, when ensemble and concert band classes will perform at their pre-assessment concert um, at 7 p.m. that night. They'll be performing uh, selected pieces that they'll play at their assessments on March 1st and March 20, or sorry, uh, February 29th, I believe as well, um, to get their rating for their, um, for their district. Nextly for representatives, the next student rep for the uh, upcoming school board meeting on February 26th will be Chad Brown. 
um, unless there are any um, any complications, uh, it will most likely be him uh, coming to the next school board meeting. I can interrupt you just a minute. You might remind him that's going to be a budget work session. Oh. He can still be there. It's fine. Okay. But it's going to be all about budget. It's not a regular meeting, okay? You Sounds can good. have him call Dr. Boyd if he wants to have more details about what that might look like, okay? Sounds but good. He can still be there, okay? I'll inform him about that one. But it won't be probably no reports or anything like this that we're doing, okay? So um, moving on to my last list, um, just this week, uh, our King George High School Crew Club announced what our theme will be for our prom on April 19th, which the theme this year is called Met Gala, which I find pretty interesting. Um, and lastly, for um, three other remarks I have, one question I do want to ask before I go on to my first remark is, um, what is the plan for the new cell phone policy that's, um, that you guys are discussing about at this time? Well, I don't know if you heard, Dr. Boyd has a large committee that's meeting about that, and we're going to have a work session on the 11th of March that's specifically going to talk about that. So it's a little premature to say what we're going to do. We don't know yet. We're, we're definitely looking at um, restricting and changing the cell phone policy. We don't know what that looks like yet. That, so we're in the midst of, con there are students on the committee. How many students, Dr. Boyd? Uh, there's 25 total people with, uh, I think, middle and high school students represented, all, many different stakeholder yeah. groups. So we're, we, I can't really say anything because there's no decisions at this point about what it will look like. All right, then. Um, well, in that case, uh, since there isn't an um, exact plan of what the changes will be, I'll, for now, post uh, push off to the side my remark about the cell phone policy. Um, Excuse me, Kata, could you do a favor for, for, I believe, all of us? Let the students know it's wonderful they're talking about it, but let them know nothing has been decided yet. You know how rumors can get started and they go all different directions. So just kind of, you know, let them know they're still discussing their student input. Nothing has been decided. And when it is, we will let everybody know. Don't worry. Yes, I'll absolutely do that. Um, so last thing I have for tonight is um, I would like to let students know that they can send in requests of any announcement they would like to, like for me or Chad or Tony to announce at the next school board meetings about any events or achievements that a sports or uh, club team achieved um, before the school board meeting so they can be um thing be uh i'm so sorry <laughs> okay. um so they can be heard of their achievements and what they did over the over the past week and that's all for uh for my report thank you connor thank you mr frank when it works <laughs> just want to thank everybody who came out tonight uh, and spoke uh, also want to thank the Sealson Elementary School Drama Club for their uh, pledge of allegiance those kids were pretty pretty amazing um, I know it was a hard subject to, to speak on it's really hard for us sitting up here uh, I will assure you that you know this stuff happened before anybody up here on this board got here uh but we are in the process of fixing it and uh you know i believe in empowering parents for everything that we do parents should be a part of it uh as much as possible there so uh, i think dr boyd's plan of emp empowering parents uh is one that will work uh and that's that's as far as I'm concerned, that's our approach to this whole thing is empowering parents to to uh, to work on this. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Frank. Uh, Ms. Hoover. Thank you, Mr. Frank. That was I couldn't have put that better myself. Empowering parents is definitely our goal. Um, I 
wanted to uh, thank the all of the CTE teachers that uh, were part of the treasure hunt last Friday at the professional development day. Um, was that last Friday or Friday before? I've lost track of time, but um, Mr. Frank and I attended that and uh, got to see a lot of the a lot of the things that the students are doing, um, 3D modeling that I had a hard time following the instructions on, <laughs> um, and that the, the uh, welding classes, and it was just, a, it was a good afternoon. Ms. Renko's and the staff are doing a great job. Um, and then I also attended the later session of Major Callahan's uh, NJROTC debate. And uh, from what I understand, the second session was a little different because the class was pretty evenly divided in terms of pros and cons. And uh, I was really impressed with their with their speaking ability and their knowledge and uh, just their really, um, their resolve to be involved and be heard. So I thank Major Callahan for encouraging the students to take, take a part in, in this very important decision. Um, and I will be attending the Reverse Career Fair on Wednesday. So I'm looking forward to that. Thanks for the reminder. That's all. Thank you, Mr. Rawls. Well, first of all, I'll just say uh, it was great to have the Sealston Elementary School Drama Club come here to tell us about what they're doing. It's a great learning opportunity for the kids, telling us they like teamwork, the creativity from costumes, the public speaking opportunity is wonderful too. It's great to see them doing that, and I know their drama instructor puts in a lot of long hours to do that, so I appreciate her doing that. A uh, big night tonight, obviously, with the budget presentation and all the discussion about the, the books. So could say a lot about it, but I wanted to just limit myself to five main points on that just to address it. Uh, first of all, I really appreciate everybody coming out and speaking about this very important topic. I mean, it's not just two sides. I mean, there's lots of different perspectives. So I think that the best thing we could do is to hear the good intentions behind everyone's position. And, uh, and I think we've been able to do that a lot with the uh, solution that Dr. Boyd has presented. That is, also, we care about kids, protecting kids. So that can be uh, you know, emotional as well as the idea of freedom and free speech. We want to obviously uh, advance that principle. So, so I do see that we're trying to see all those things and apply them to the solution, and that's going to be very good. And the second thing is it's important to remember why we're here, and we're all sitting here, we're constitutional officers. So a good place to uh, go to remember that is the Virginia Constitution. And you look at Article 1, which is the Bill of Rights, Section 15, which is titled, the qualities necessary to preserve a free government, which is only two paragraphs, so I'd love to read it to you, but for the sake of time, I won't, I'll just paraphrase. But I do recommend to our government class students, I, 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 advise them to, or I'd recommend that they read it and discuss because it's really good stuff. Uh, but it's a paraphrase. It says that for free government and for the blessings of liberty, we need several things to preserve that. And among those is virtue, a virtuous citizen, citizenry. And, uh, and also, it's appropriate that this is in the list of Bill of Rights that, that recognizes that not only do we have rights, but as citizens, we need to recognize our duties. And finally, it talks about the need to diffuse knowledge and develop our skills and talents. And for that purpose, we have a system of education in the Commonwealth. So putting that all together, I see our mission up here as uh, developing and graduating virtuous young men and women who are ready to assume the duties of citizenship upon graduation. And so I think everything we do, including every budget we pass, every motion we make, every even every book we buy should advance those that mission. And then for a third point, I'll say this is public education. So we need to be here to serve the entire community, we, which includes having an environment that people feel safe in. They don't need to worry about what their kids might encounter. And it's, it should be focusing on all the things we can agree on. There's so much. When you look at education, it's, it's a wonderful thing, learning about the universe, you know, science, math, precision, how things work, arts, humanities, 
there's so much good that we can teach kids and focusing on that is what we need to do. And I think there's so much that we can agree on and that's what we need to find and focus on so public school is inclusive for everybody, all the taxpayers that are paying for it. And four, I mean, there's talk about book banning, but we need to realize that someone's deciding what's appropriate. We don't have room or budget to buy absolutely every book that's out there, so we're having to pick which ones to include. So making sure that we choose the best with the limited tax dollars that we have is absolutely uh, paramount. And final point is that kids aren't adults, but we are, like I said, trying to raise them to be good adults, good citizens, which includes exposing them to some controversy to be able to think through those things, like talking about debating cell phones. But that's a good, harmless thing to debate to develop their minds in that in that way. And at the same time, we need to realize that kids are impressionable. These are their formative years, and not want to expose them to anything that would that would harm them in any way. So, great discussion. Thank you for everyone coming out to discuss that. That's all I have. I thank you. I'll be brief. <laughs> uh, I also want to thank the Sealston Drama Club. It was wonderful that they were here and did that. Um, and also, um, Dr. Boyd, I'd like you to personally um, go to librarians and the teacher, but especially a librarian, and thank her. And we appreciate her efforts and acknowledge her anguish with all this because it had to have been difficult. And just thank her on behalf of the board. Tell her we just appreciate who she is and what she's done, all the librarians, actually, uh, and what they do with this. And tell them that we do trust them. And we care. Um, and the same with the teachers. It's just that this has mostly been about library and library books. But uh, and I think, we've, again, we've already reiterated, I think the procedures uh, uh, follows the policy, but I appreciate all the work that has been done. It's been a tremendous amount. Um, I was also, as I already mentioned, uh, the debate on the cell phone at the NJROTC, and I appreciate uh, Major Callahan, and then also, hmm, I forget his name, the other one that was there. Master the, Sergeant Airport. Yes, Master Sergeant, thank you. Anyway, he, uh, you guys did a wonderful job, and I really appreciate the, I know this was kind of a special group of kids, I guess, the respect that they had for you, Major Callahan, and the way that you conducted the class and the way that they responded to each other in a very respectful way. And I think they gained a tremendous amount about listening, listening to each other, even listening to some of those opinions of the school board about cell phones and so on. And uh, again, Connor, like I said before, now, with no decisions have been made yet. We, this, is in, this is the time we want to hear from everybody, okay? Um, uh, the budget presentation, Dr. Boyd, thank you. I know it's a lot of work, and the amount of hours that you put in, just um, appreciate you very much. I want you to know that, okay? Uh, I attended the never-ending story, uh, my wife and I, and it was, it was good. It was interesting. Uh, we visited uh, middle school teachers. I visited with 25 of them on that professional development. I can't remember whether I mentioned that at the last meeting or not. Thank you, Connor. You did a great job. Appreciate you reporting on what's going on at the high school and uh, all the reps that we have. And I kind of, it's interesting. There's three of you now rotating. And uh, again, the comments that were made this evening, that's what we're all about is uh, listening because <clears throat> we all have the same goal to do the best job we can for our students, making sure they're well educated uh, and uh, making sure the resources are the best that we can provide. And part of that is being able to listen to the community and the parents. And I think we've done that. And I hope, I know it's late, but I hope that some of them may still be listening. All right, do I have a motion to go into closed session? Pursuant to state code section 233712A of the Code of Virginia, I move that the board convene in a closed meeting to review hire substitutes, retirements, and resignations as permitted under 2.2-3711A, number one of the Code of Virginia. I have a second. 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 All those in favor, say aye. Aye. All right. Chair votes aye. We're now in closed session.
Do we have a motion to return to open session? I move that the Keene George County School Board return to open session and certify that pursuant to state code section 2.2-3712D, only public business matters lawfully exempt from open meeting requirements under this chapter. And only such public business matters as were identified in the motion by which the closed meeting was convened were heard, discussed, or considered in the meeting by the public body. I second and certify. So certify. Certify. I also certify. Uh, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Chair votes aye. We're now in open session. All right, uh, action resulting from the closed meeting. Do we have a motion to approve the personnel as presented? I'll make a motion to approve the per personnel as presented in closed session. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Chair votes aye. They're approved. Do I have a motion to adjourn? I move we adjourn. I second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Chair votes aye. We are now adjourned.